1984, by George Orwell. Chapter 1 It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking thirteen. Winston Smith, his chin nuzzled into his breast into an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and of old rag mats. At one end of it, a color poster, too large for indoor display, had been tacked to the wall. It depicted simply an enormous face, more than a meter wide. The face of a man of about 45 with a heavy with a heavy black mustache and ruggedly handsome features. Winston made for the stairs. It was no use trying the lift. Even at the best of times, it was seldom working, and at present, the electric current was cut off during daylight. It was part of the economy drive in preparation for hate week. The flat was seven flights up, and Winston, who was 39 and had a varicose ulcer above his right ankle, went slowly, resting several times on the way. On each landing, opposite the lift shaft, the poster with the enormous face gazed from the wall. It was one of those pictures which are so contrived that the eyes follow you about when you move. Big Brother is watching you. The caption beneath it ran. Inside the flat, a fruity voice was reading out a list of, figure, of figures, which has something to do with the production of pig iron. The voice came from an oblong metal plate like a dulled mirror, which formed part of the surface of a right-hand wall. Winston turned a switch, and the voice sank somewhat. though the words were still distinguishable. The instrument, the telescreen it was called, could be dimmed, but there was no way of shutting it off completely. He moved over to the window. A smallish, frail figure. The meagerness of his body merely emphasized by the blue overalls which were the uniform of the party. His hair was very fair, his face naturally sanguine, his skin roughened by the coarse soap and blunt razor blades and the cold of the winter that had just ended. Outside, even through the shut window pane, the world looked cold. Down in the street, little eddies of wind were whirling dust and torn paper into spirals, and though the sun was shining in the sky a harsh blue, there seemed to be no color in anything except the posters that were plastered everywhere. The black mustachioed face gazed down from every commanding corner. There was one on the house front immediately opposite. Big Brother is watching you, the captain said, while the dark eyes looked deep into Winston's own. Down at street level, another poster, torn at one corner, flapped fitfully in the wind, alternately covering and uncovering the single word, Inksock. In the far distance, a helicopter skimmed down between the roofs, hovered for an instant like a blue boat bottle, and darted away again with a curving flight. It was a police patrol, snooping into people's windows. The patrols did not matter, however. Only the thought police mattered. Behind Winston's back, the voice from the telescreen was still babbling away about pig iron and the overfulfillment of the nine three year plan. The telescreen received and transmitted simultaneously. Any sound that Winston made Above the level of a very low whisper, would it be picked up by it? Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision which the metal plate commanded, 
he could be seen as well as heard. There is, of course, no way knowing whether you are being watched at any given moment. How often, or in what system, the thought police plugged in on any individual wire was guesswork. It was even conceivable that they watched everybody all the time. But at any rate, they could plug in your wire whenever they wanted to. You had to live, did live, from habit that became instinct, and the assumption that every sound you made was overheard and, except in darkness, every movement scrutinized. Winston kept his back turned to the telescreen. It was safer, though as he well knew, even a back and revealing. A kilometer away, the Ministry of Truth, his place of work, towered vast and white above a grimy landscape. This, he thought, with a sort of vague distaste. This was London, chief city of Airstrip 1, itself the third most populous of the provinces of Oceania. He tried to squeeze out some childhood memory that should tell him whether London had always been quiet like this. Were there always these vistas of rotting 19th century houses, their sides shored up with balks of timber, the windows patched with cardboard, and their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions, and the bomb sites where the plaster dust swirled in the air and the willow herbs straggled over the heaps of rubble, and the places where the bombs had cleared a larger patch and there had sprung up sordid colonies of wooden dwellings like chicken houses. But it was no use. He could not remember. Nothing remained of his childhood except a series of bright lid tableau occurring against no background and mostly unintelligible. The Ministry of Truth, many true and new speak, was startlingly different from any other object in sight. It was an enormous pyramidal structure of glittering white concrete, soaring up terrace after terrace, 300 meters into the air. From where Winston stood, it was just possible to read, picked out on its white face in elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. The Ministry of Truth contained, it was said, 3,000 rooms above ground level and corresponding ramifications below. Scattered about London, there was just three other buildings of similar appearance and size. So completely did they dwarf the surrounding architecture that from the roof of Victory Mansions, you could see all four of them simultaneously. They were the homes of the four ministries between which the entire apparatus of government was divided. The Ministry of Truth, which concerned itself with news, entertainment, education, and the fine arts. The Ministry of Peace, which concerned itself with war. The Ministry of Love, which maintained law and order. And the Ministry of Plenty, which was responsible for economic affairs. Their names in Newspeak. Many True, Many Pax, Many Love, and Many Plenty. The Ministry of Love was a really frightening one. There were no windows in it at all. Winston had never been inside the Ministry of Love, nor more than half a kilometer of it. It was a place impossible to enter except on official business, and then only by penetrating through the maze of barbed wire entanglements, steel doors, and hidden machine gun nests. Even the streets leading up to its outer barriers were Rome or gorilla-faced guards in black uniforms, armed with jointed truncheons. 
Winston turned round abruptly. He had set his features into the expression of quiet optimism which it was advisable to wear when facing the telescreen. He crossed the room into the tiny kitchen. Believing the ministry at this time of the day, he had sacrificed his lunch in the canteen, and he was aware that there was no food in the kitchen except a hunk of dark-colored bread which had got to be saved for tomorrow's breakfast. He took down from the shelf a bottle of colorless liquid with a plain white label marked the Victory Gin. It gave off a sickly, oily smell as of Chinese rice spirit. Winston poured out nearly a cup, teacupful. Nerved itself for a shock and gulped it down like a dose of medicine. Instantly, his face turned scarlet and the water ran out of his eyes. The stuff was like nitric acid and moreover, and swallowing it went out the sensation of being hit on the back of the head with a rubber club. The next moment, however, the burning in his belly died down and the world began to look more cheerful. He took a cigarette from a crumpled packet marked Victory Cigarettes and incautiously held it upright, whereupon the tobacco fell out of into the fore. With the next, he was more successful. He went back to the living room and sat down at a small table that stood to the left of the telescreen. From the table drawer, he took out a pen holder, a bottle of ink, and a thick quarter-sized blank book with a red back and a marbled cover. For some reason, the telescreen in the living room was an unusual position. Instead of being placed, as was normal in the end wall, where it could command the whole room, it was in a longer wall, opposite the window. To one side of it, there was a shallow alcove in which Winston was now sitting, and which, when the flats were built, had probably been intended to hold bookshelves. By sitting in the alcove, and keeping well back, Winston was able to remain outside the range of the telescreen, so far as sight went. He could be heard, of course, but so long as he stayed in his present position, he could not be seen. It was partly the unusual geography of the room that had suggested him the thing that he was now about to do. But it had also been suggested by the book that he had just taken out of the drawer. It was a peculiarly beautiful book. Its smooth, creamy paper, a little yellowed by age, was of a kind that had not manufactured for at least 40 years past. He could guess, however, that the book was much older than that. He had seen it lying in the window of a frowsy little junk shop in a slummy quarter of the town, just what quarter he did not know, remember, and had been stricken immediately by an overwhelming desire to possess it. Party members were supposed not to go into ordinary shops, dealing on the free market, it was called. But the rule was not strictly kept, because there were various things such as shoelaces and razor blades, which it was impossible to get hold of in any other way. He had given a quick glance up and down the street, and then had slipped inside and bought the book for $2.50. At the same time, he was not conscious of wanting it for a particular purpose. He had carried it guiltily home in its briefcase. Even with nothing written in it, it was a compromising possession. The thing that he was about to do was to open a diary. This was not illegal. Nothing was illegal since there were no longer any laws. But if detected, it was reasonably certain that it would be punished by death, or at least by 25 years in a forced labor camp. Winston fitted a nib into the pen holder and sucked it to get the grease off. The pen was an archaic instrument, seldom used even for signatures, and he had procured one, furtively and with some difficulty. 
simply because of a feeling that the beautiful creamy paper deserved to be written on which a real nib instead of being scratched with an ink pencil. Actually, he was not used to writing it by hand. Apart from very short notes, it was usual to dictate everything and to the speak rate, which was of course impossible for his present purpose. He dipped the pen into the ink and then faltered for just a second. A tremor had gone through his bowels. To mark the paper was a decisive act. In small clumsy letters he wrote, April 4th, 1984. He sat back. A sense of complete helplessness had descended upon him. To begin with, he did not know with any certainty that this was 1984. It must be round about that date, since he was fairly sure that his age was 39, and he believed that he had been born in 1944 or 1945. But it was never possible nowadays to pin down any dates within a year or two. For whom, it suddenly occurred to him to wonder, was he writing this diary? For the future, for the unborn. His mind hovered for a moment around the doubtful date on the page and then fetched up with a bump against a newspeak word double think. For the first time, the magnitude of what he had undertaken came home to him. How could you com communicate with the future? It was of its nature impossible. Either the future would resemble the present, in which case it would not listen to him, or it would be different from it, and its predicament would be meaningless. For some time, he sat gazing stupidly at the paper. The telescreen had changed over to strut into military music. It was curious that he seemed not merely to have lost the power of expressing himself, but even to have forgotten what it was that he had originally intended to say. For weeks past, he had been making ready for this moment, and it had never crossed his mind that anything would be needed except courage. The actual writing would be easy. All he had to do was to transfer to the paper the interminable, restless monologue that had been running inside his head, literally for years. At this moment, however, even the monologue had dried up. Moreover, his varicose ulcer had begun itching unbearably. He dared not scratch it because if he did so, it always became inflamed. The seconds were tickling by. He was conscious of nothing except the blankness of a page in front of him and the itching of the skin above his ankle the blaring of the music, and a slight booziness caused by the gin. Suddenly, he began writing in sheer panic, only imperfectly aware of what he was setting down. His small but childish handwriting straggled up and down the page, shedding first its capital letters and finally even its full stops. April 4th. 1984. Last night to the flicks. All war films. One very good one of a ship full of refugees being bombed somewhere in the Mediterranean. Audience much amused by shots of a great huge fat man trying to swim away with a helicopter after him. First you saw him wallowing along in the water like a porpoise. Then you saw him through the helicopter's gun sights. Then he was full of holes and the sea around him turned pink, and he sank as suddenly as though the holes had let in the water. Audience, shouting with laughter when he sank. Then you saw a lifeboat full of children with a helicopter hovering over it. There was a middle-aged woman, might have been a Jewish, sitting up and the bow with a little boy about three years old in her arms. 
little boy screaming with fright and hiding his head between her breasts as if he was trying to borrow right into her and the woman putting her arms around him and comforting him, although she was blue with fright herself. All the time covering him up as much as possible as if she thought her arms could keep the bullets off him. Then the helicopter planted a 20 kilo bomb in among which terrific flash and the boat went all to matchwood. Then there was a wonderful shot of a child's arm going up, 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 right up into the air. A helicopter with a camera and its nose must have followed it up. And there was a lot of applause from the party seats. But a woman down in the parole part of the house suddenly started kicking up a fuss and shouting they didn't ought her of showed it. Not in front of the kids, they didn't it. Ain't right not in the front of kids, it ain't. Until the police turned her, turned her out. I don't suppose anything happened to her. Nobody cares what the parole say. Typical parole reaction they never... Winston stopped writing. Partly because he was suffering from cramp. He did not know what had made him pour out this stream of rubbish. But the curious thing was that, while he was doing so totally different memory had clarified itself in his mind, to the point where it almost felt equal to writing it down. It was, he now realized, because of this other incident that he had suddenly decided to come home and begin the diary today. It had happened that morning at the ministry, if anything so nebulous could be said to happen. It was nearly 1100, and in the records department, where Winston worked, they were dragging the chairs out of the cubicles and grouping them in the center of the hall, opposite the big telescreen in preparation for the two minutes hate. Winston was just taking his place in one of the middle rows when two people whom he knew by sight but had never spoken to, came unexpectedly into the room. One of them was a girl who he often passed in the corridors. He did not know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department, presumably, since he had sometimes seen her with oily hands and carrying a spanner. She had some mechanical job in one of the novel writing machines. She was a bull-looking girl about 27, with thick, dark hair, a freckled face, and swift, athletic movements. A narrow scarlet sash, emblem of a junior anti-sex league, was wound several times around the waist of her overalls, just tightly enough to bring out the shapelessness of her hips. Winston disliked her from the very first moment of seeing her. He knew the reason. It was because of the atmosphere of hot gray fields and cold baths, community hikes, and general clean-mindedness which she managed to carry about with her. He disliked nearly all women, and especially the young and pretty ones. It was always the woman, and above all the young ones, who are the most bigoted adherents of the party. The swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies and nosers out of unorthodoxy. But this particular girl gave him the impression of being more dangerous than the most. Once when they passed in the corridor, she had given him a quick sidelong glance, which seemed to pierce right into him and for a moment had filled him with black terror. The idea had even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the thought police. That, it was true, was very unlikely. Still, he continued to feel a peculiar uneasiness, which had fear mixed up in it, as well as hostility, whenever she was anywhere near him. The other person was a man named O'Brien, a member of the inner party and holder of some post so important and remote that Winston had only a dim idea of its nature. A momentary hush passed over the group of people around the chairs as he saw the black overalls of the inner party member approaching. O'Brien was a large, burly man with a thick neck and a coarse, humorous, brutal face. 
in spite of his formidable appearance. He had a certain charm of manner. He had a chick of wrist settling his spectacles on his nose, which was curiously disarming in some undefinable way, curiously civilized. It was a gesture which, if anyone had still thought in such terms, might have recalled an 18th century nobleman of offering his stuff box. Winston had seen O'Brien perhaps a dozen times in almost as many years. He felt deeply drawn to him, and not solely because he was intrigued by the contrast between O'Brien's urban manner and his prize fighter's physique. Much more of it was because of a secretly held belief, or perhaps not even a belief, merely a hope, that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. Something in his face suggested it irresistibly, and again, perhaps it was not even an unorthodoxy that was written in a face, but simply intelligence. But at any rate, he had the appearance of being a person that you could talk to if somehow you could cheat the telescreen and get him alone. Winston had never made the smallest effort to verify this guess. Indeed, there was no way of doing so. At this moment, O'Brien glanced at his wristwatch, saw that it was nearly 1100, and evidently decided to stay in the records department until the two minutes' hate was over. He took a chair in the same row as Winston a couple of places away. A small, sandy-haired woman, who worked in the next cubicle to Winston, was between them. The girl with dark hair was sitting immediately behind. The next moment, a hideous, grinding screech, as of some monstrous machine running without oil, burst from the big telescreen at the end of the room. It was a noise that set one's teeth on edge and bristled the hair at the back of one's neck. The hate had started. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, had flashed onto the screen. There were hisses here and there among the audience. The little sandy-haired woman gave a squeak of mingled fear and disgust. Goldstein was the renegade and backslider who once long ago, how long ago nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself, and then had engaged in counter-revolutionary activities, had been condemned to death, and had mysteriously escaped and disappeared. The program of the two minutes hate varied from day to day, but there was none in which Goldstein was not in the principal figure. He was a primal traitor, the earliest defiler of the party's purity. All subsequent crimes against the party, all treacheries, acts of sabotage, heresies, deviations, sprang directly out of his teaching. Somewhere or other, he was still alive and hatching his conspiracies. Perhaps somewhere beyond the sea, under the protection of his foreign paymasters. Perhaps even, so it was occasionally rumored, and some hiding place in Oceania itself. Winston's diaphragm was constricted. He could never see the face of Goldstein without a painful mixture of emotions. It was a lean Jewish face with a great fuzzy aureole of white hair and small goatee beard. A clever face and yet somehow inherently despicable with a kind of senile silliness. In the long thin nose near the end of which a pair of spectacles was perched. It resembled the face of a sheep and the voice too had sheep-like quality. Goldstein was delivering his usual venomous attack upon the doctrines of the party an attack so exaggerated and perverse that a child should have been able to see through it, and yet just plausible enough to fill one with an alarmed feeling that other people, less level-headed than oneself, might be taken in by it. He was abusing Big Brother. He was denouncing the dictatorship of the party. 
He was demanding the immediate conclusion of peace with Eurasia. He was advocating freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of thought. He was crying hysterically that the revolution had been betrayed. And all this and rapid polysyllabic speech, which was a sort of parody of the habitual style of the orators of the party, and even contained newspeak words. More newspeak words, indeed, than any party member could normally use in real life. And all the while, lest one should be in any doubt as to the reality which Goldstein's specious claptrap covered, behind his head on the telescreen there marched the endless columns of Eurasian army. Row after row, row of solid-looking men in expressionless Asiatic faces, who swam up to the surface of the screen and vanished to be replaced by others exactly similar. The dull, rhythmic tramp of a soldier's boots formed the background to Goldstein's bleeding voice. Before the hate had proceeded for 30 seconds, uncontrollable exclamations of rage were breaking out from half the people in the room. The self-satisfied sheep-like face on the screen and the terrifying power of the Eurasian army behind it were too much to be borne. Besides, the sight or even the thought of Goldstein produced fear and anger automatically. He was an object of hatred more constant than earlier either Eurasia of East Asia. Since an Oceania was at war with one of these powerful powers, it was generally at peace with the other. But what was strange was that although Goldstein was hated and despised by everybody, although every day and a thousand times a day on platforms, on the telescreen, in newspapers, in books, his theories were refuted, smashed, ridiculed, held up to the general gaze for the pitiful rubbish that they were. In spite of all this, his influence never seemed to grow less. Always there were fresh dupes waiting to be seduced by him. A day never passed when spies and saboteurs acting under his directions were not unmasked by the thought police. He was a commander of vast shadowy army, an underground network of conspirators dedicated to the overthrow of a state. The Brotherhood, its name was supposed to be. There were also whispered stories of a terrible book, a compendium of the, all the heresies, of which Goldstein was the author and which circulated clandestinely here and there. It was a book without a title. People referred to it, if at all, simply as the book. But one knew of such things only through vague rumors. Neither the Brotherhood nor the book was a subject that any ordinary party member would mention if there was a way of avoiding it. In its second minute, the hate rose to a frenzy. People were leaping up and down in their places and shouting at the top of their voices in an effort to drown the maddening, bleating voice that came from the screen. A little sandy-haired woman had toned a bright pink, and her mouth was opening and shutting like that of a late landed fish. Even O'Brien's heavy face was flushed. He was sitting very straight in his chair, his powerful chest swelling, quivering as though as he was standing up to an assault of a wave. The dark-haired girl beside Winston had begun crying out, Swine! 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 And suddenly, she picked up a heavy newspeak dictionary, and flung it at the screen. It struck Goldstein's nose and bounced off. The voice continued inexorably. In a lucid moment, Winston found that he was shouting with the others and kicking his heel violently against the rung of his chair. The horrible thing about the two minutes' hate was not that one was obliged to take a part, but that it was impossible to avoid joining in. Within 30 seconds, any pretense was always unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness. A desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, 
turning one even against one's will into a grimacing, screaming lunatic. And yet, the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion which could be switched from one object to another like the flame of a blow lamp. Thus, at one moment, Wenson's hatred was not turned against Goldstein at all, but on the contrary against Big Brother, the party, and the Thought Police. And at such moments, his heart went out to the lonely, derided heretic on the screen, sole guardian of truth and sanity in world of lies. And yet, the very next instant, he was at one with the people about him, and all that was said of Goldstein seemed to him to be true. At those moments, his secret loathing of Big Brother changed into adoration, and Big Brother seemed to tower up an invincible, fearless protector, standing like a rock against the hordes of Asia, and Goldstein, in spite of his isolation, his helplessness, and the doubt that hung about him very existence, seemed like some sinister enchanter, capable by the mere power of his voice of wrecking the structure of civilization. It was even possible at moments to switch one's hatred this way or that by a voluntary act. Suddenly, by the sort of violent effort with which one wrenches one's head away from the pillow in a nightmare, whence it succeeded in transferring his hatred from the face on the screen to the dark-haired girl behind him. Vivid, beautiful hallucinations flashed through his mind. He could flog her to death with a rubber truncheon. He could tie her naked to a stick and shoot her full of arrows like St. Sebastian. He would ravish her and cut her throat at the moment of climax. Better than before, moreover, he realized why it was that he hated her. He hated her because she was young and pretty, because he wanted to go to bed with her, would never do so, because around her sweet supple waist, which seemed to ask you to encircle it with her arm, there was only an odious scarlet sash, aggressive symbol of chastity. The hate rose to its climax. The voice of Goldstein had become an actual sheep's bleat, and for an instant, the face changed into that of a sheep. Then the sheep face melted into the figure of a Eurasian soldier who seemed to be advancing, huge and terrible, his submachine gun roaring and seeming to spread out the surface of the screen so that some of the people in the front row actually flinched backwards in their seats. But in the same moment, drawing a deep sigh of relief from everybody, the hostile figure melted into the face of Big Brother, black-haired, black mustachioed, full of power and mysterious calm, and so vast that it almost filled up the screen. Nobody heard what Big Brother was saying. It was merely a few words of encouragement, the sort of words that are unuttered in the din of battle, not distinguishable indivis individually, but restoring confidence by the fact of being spoken. Then the face of Big Brother faded away again, and instead, the three slogans of the party stood out in bold capitals. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. But the face of Big Brother seemed to persist for several seconds on the screen, as though the impact that it had made on everyone's eyeballs were too vivid to wear off immediately. The little sandy-haired woman had flung herself forward over the back of a chair in front of her. With a tremulous murmur that sounded like, My Savior, she extended her arms toward the screen. Then she buried her face in her hands. It was apparent that she was uttering a prayer. At this moment, the entire group of people broke into a deep, slow, rhythmical chant of BB, BB, BB over and over again, very slowly with a long pause between the first B and the second. A heavy, murmurous sound, somewhat curiously savage, in the background of which one seemed to hear the stamp of naked feet and the throbbing of tom-toms. For perhaps as much as 30 seconds, they kept it up. It was a refrain that was often heard in moments of overwhelming emotion. Partly it was a short of him to the wisdom and majesty of Big Brother. But still more, it was an act of self-hypnosis, a deliberate drowning of consciousness by means of rhythmic noise. Winston's entrails seemed to grow cooled. 
and the two minutes hate, he could not stop sharing the general delirium. But the subhuman chanting of BB, BB, always filled him with horror. Of course, he chanted with the rest. It was impossible to do otherwise. To dissemble your feelings, to control your face, to do what everyone else was doing, was an instinctive reaction. But there was a space of a couple of seconds during which the expressions in his eyes might conceivably have betrayed him. And it was exactly at this moment of a significant thing happened. If indeed it did happen. Momentarily, he caught O'Brien's eye. O'Brien had stood up. He had taken off his spectacles as within the act of resettling them on his nose with his character characteristic gesture. But there was a fraction of a second when their eyes met, and for as long as it took to happen, Winston knew, yes, he knew, that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. An unmistakable message had passed. It was as though their two minds had opened and the thoughts were flowing from one into the other through their eyes. I'm with you, O'Brien seemed to be saying to him. I know precisely what you're feeling. I know all about your contempt, your hatred, your disgust. But don't worry, I'm on your side. And then the flash of intelligence was gone, and O'Brien's face was as inscrutable as everyone else's. That was all, and he was already uncertain whether it had happened. Such incidents never had any sequel. All that they did was to keep alive in him the belief or hope that others besides himself were the enemies of the party. Perhaps the rumors of vast underground conspiracies were true after all. Perhaps the Brotherhood really existed. It was impossible, in spite of the endless arrests and confessions and executions, to be sure that the Brotherhood was not simply a myth. Some days he believed in it, some days not. There was no evidence, only fleeting glimpses that might mean anything or nothing. Snatches of overheard conversation, faint scribbles on laboratory walls. Once, even, when two strangers met, a small movement of the hands which had looked as though it might be a signal of recognition. It was all guesswork. Very likely he had imagined everything. He had gone back to his cubicle without looking at O'Brien again. The idea of following up their momentary contact hardly crossed his mind. It would have been inconceivably dangerous even if he had known how to set about doing it. For a second, two seconds, they had exchanged an, an equivocal glance. And that was the end of the story. But even that was a memorable event in the locked loneliness in which one had to live. Winston roused himself and sat up straighter. He let out a belch. The gin was writing from his stomach. His eyes refocused on the page. He discovered that while he sat helplessly musing that he had also been writing, as though by automatic action. And it was no longer the same cramped, awkward handwriting as before. His pen had slid voluptuously over the smooth paper printing in large, neat capitals. Down with Big Brother. 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 Over and over again, filling half a page. He could not help feeling a twinge of panic. It was absurd since the writing of those particular words was not more dangerous than the initial act of opening the diary. But for a moment, he was tempted to tear up the spoiled pages and abandon the enterprise altogether. He did not do so, however, because he knew that it was useless. Whether he wrote down with Big Brother or whether he refrained from writing it made no difference. Whether he went on with the diary or whether he did not go on with it made no difference. The thought police would get him just the same. He had committed would still have committed, even if he had never set pen to paper. The essential crime that contained all others in itself. Thought crime, they called it. 
thought crime was not only a thing that could be concealed forever. You might dodge successfully for a while, even for years, but sooner or later they were bound to get you. It was always at night. The arrest invariably stepped at night. The sudden jerk out of sleep, the rough hand shaking your shoulder, the lights glaring in your eyes, the ring of hard faces around the bed. In the vast majority of cases, there was no trial, no report of the arrest. People simply disappeared, always during the night. Her name was removed from the registers. Every record of everything you had ever done was wiped out. Your one-time existence was denied and then forgotten. You were abolished, annihilated, vaporized was a usual word. For a moment, he was seized by a kind of hysteria. He began writing in a hurried, untidy scrawl. They'll shoot me, I don't care. They'll shoot me in the back of the neck, I don't care. Down the with break, brother. They always shoot you in the back of the neck, I don't care. Down the with break, brother. He sat back in his chair, slightly ashamed of himself, and laid down the pen. The next moment, he started violently. There was a knocking at the door. Already, he sat as still as a mouse in the futile hope that whoever it was might go away after a single attempt. But no, the knocking was repeated. The worst thing of all would be to delay. His heart was thumping like a drum, but his face, from long habit, was probably expressionless. He got up and moved heavily toward the door. As he put his head to the doorknob, Winston saw that he had left the diary open on the table. Down with Big Brother was written all over it, in letters almost big enough to be legible across the room. It was an unconceivably stupid thing to have done. But he realized, even in his panic, he had not wanted to smudge the creamy paper by shutting the book while the ink was wet. He drew in his breath and opened the door. Instantly, a warm wave of relief flowed through him. A colorless, crushed-looking woman with wispy hair and a lined face was standing outside. Oh, comrade, she began in a dreary, whining sort of voice. I thought I heard you come in. Do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It's got blocked up and... It was Mrs. Parsons, the wife of a neighbor on the same floor. Mrs. was a word somewhat disencountenced by the party. You're supposed to call everyone comrade. But with some woman, one used it instinctively. She was a woman about 30, but looking much older. One of the impression that there was a dust in the creases of her face. Winston followed her down the passage. These amateur repair jobs were on almost daily irritation. Victory mansions, or old flats, built in 1930 or thereabouts, and were falling to pieces. The plaster flaked constantly from ceilings and walls. The pipes burst in every hard frost. The roof leaked whenever there was snow. The heating system was usually running at half steam when it was not closed down altogether from motives of economy. Repairs, except what you could do for yourself, had to be sanctioned by remote committees, which were liable to hold up even the mending of a window pane for two years. Of course it's only because Tom is at home, said Mrs. Parsons vaguely. The Parsons' flat was bigger than Winston's, and dingy in a different way. Everything had a battered, trampled-on look, as though the place had just been visited by some large, violent animal. Games and pedimenta. Hockey sticks, boxing gloves, a burst football, a pair of sweaty shorts turned inside out, lay all over the floor, and on the table where there was a litter of dirty dishes and dog exercise books. 
On the wall were scarlet banners of the Youth League and the Spies, and a full-size poster of Big Brother. There was a usual boiled cabbage smell, common to the whole building, but it was shot through by a sharper reek of sweat, which no one knew. That's the first sniff, though it was hard to say how. It was the sweat of some person not present at the moment. In another room, someone with a comb and a piece of toilet paper was trying to keep two with the military music, which is still issuing for the telescreen. It's the children, said Mrs. Parsons, casting a half-apprehensive glance at the door. They haven't been out today, and of course... She had a habit of breaking off her sentences in the middle. The kitchen sink was full nearly to the brim, with filthy greenish water which smelled worse than ever of cabbage. Winston knelt down and examined the angle joint of a pipe. He hated using his hands, and he hated bending down, which was always liable to start him coughing. Mrs. Parsons looked on helplessly. Of course if Tom was home, he'd put it right in the moment, she said. He loves anything like that. He's ever so good with his hand, Tom is. Parsons was Winston's fellow employee at the Ministry of Truth. He was a faddish but active man of paralyzing stupidity. A mass imbecile enthusiasms. One of those completely unquestioning, devoted judges on whom, more even than on the thought police, the stability of the party depended. At 35, he had just been unwillingly evicted from the Youth League. And before graduating into the Youth League, he had managed to stay on in the spies for a year beyond the statutory age. At the ministry, he was employed in some subordinate post for which intelligence was not required, but on the other hand, he was a leading figure of the sports committee, and all the other committees engaged in organizing community hikes, spontaneous demonstrations, savings campaigns, and voluntary activities generally. He would inform me with quiet pride between whiffs of his pipe, that he had put in an appearance at the community center every evening for the past four years. An overpowering smell of sweat, a sort of unconscious testimony to the strenuousness of his life, followed him about whenever he went, and even remained behind him after he had gone. Have you got a spanner? said Winston, fiddling with a nut on the ankle joint. A spanner, said Mrs. Parsons, immediately becoming interpreted. I don't know, I'm pretty sure. Perhaps the children. There was a trampling of boots and another blast on the comb as the children charged into the living room. Mrs. Parsons brought the spanner. Once let out the water and disgustedly removed the clot of human hair that had blocked up the pipe. He cleaned his fingers as best as he could in the cold water from the tap and went back into the other room. Up with your hands, yelled a savage voice. A handsome, tough-looking boy of nine had popped up from behind the table and was menacing him with a toy automatic pistol. While his small sister, about two years younger, made the same gesture with a fragment of wood. Both of them were dressed in the blue shorts, gray shirts, and red neckerchiefs, which were the uniform of the spies. Winston raised his hands above his head, but with an uneasy feeling, so vicious was the boy's demeanor, that it was not altogether a game. You're a traitor, yelled the boy. You're a thought criminal. You're a Eurasian spy. I'll shoot you. I'll vaporize you. I'll send you to the salt mines. Suddenly, they were both leaping round him, shouting traitor and thought criminal. The little girl imitating her brother in every movement. It was somehow slightly frightening, like the gambling of tiger cubs, which will soon grow up into man-eaters. There was a sort of calculating ferocity in the boy's eye, and a quite evident desire to hit or kick Winston, and a consciousness of being very nearly big enough to do so. It was a good job it was not a real pistol he was holding, Winston thought.
Mrs. Parsons' eyes flitted nervously from Winston to the children and back again. In the better light of the living room, he noticed with interest that there actually was dust in the creases of her face. They do get so noisy, she said. They're disappointed because they couldn't go to see the hanging. That's what it is. I'm too busy to take them, and Tom will be back from work in time. Why can't we go and see the hanging, grow the boy in his huge voice? Want to see the hanging, want to see the hanging, chanted the little girl still coppering around. Some Eurasian prisoners guilty of war crimes were to be hanged in the park that evening, Winston remembered. This happened about once a month and was a popular spectacle. Children always clamored to take to see it. He took his leave of Mrs. Parsons and made for the door, but he had not gone six steps down the passage when something hit the back of his neck an agonizingly painful blow. It was as though a red-hot wire had been jabbed into him. He spun round just in time to see Mrs. Parsons dragging her son back into the doorway while the boy pockered a catapult. Goldstein bellowed the boy as the door closed on him. But what most struck Winston was a look of helpless fright on the woman's grayish face. Back in the flat, he stepped quickly past Telescreen and sat down at the table again, still rubbing his neck. The music from these Telescreen had stopped. Instead, a clipped military voice was reading out with a sort of brutal relish. A description of the armaments of the new floating fortress, which had just been anchored between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. With those children, he thought, that wretched woman was lead a life of terror. Another year, two years, and they would be watching her night and day for symptoms of unorthodoxy. Nearly all the children nowadays were horrible. What was worst of all was that, by means of such organizations as the spies, they were systematically turned into ungovernable little savages. And yet this produced in them no tendency whatever to rebel against the discipline of the party. On the contrary, they adore the party and everything connected with it. The songs, the processions, the banners, the hiking, the drilling with dummy rifles, the yelling of slogans, the worship of Big Brother. It was all a sort of glorious game to them. All their ferocity was turned outwards against the enemies of the state, against foreigners, traitors, saboteurs, thought criminals. It was almost normal for people over 30 to be frightened of their own children. And with good reason, for hardly a week passed in which the Times did not carry a paragraph describing how some eavesdropping little sneak, child hero, was a phrase generally used, had overheard some compromising remark and denounced his parents to the thought police. The sting of the catapult bully had worn off. He picked up his pen half-heartedly, wondering whether he could find someone more to write in his diary. Suddenly, he began thinking of O'Brien again. Years ago, how long was it? Seven years it must be. He had dreamed that he was walking through a pitch-dark room, and someone sitting to him, one thought of him, had said it to as he passed. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness. It was said very quietly, almost casually. A statement, not a command. He had walked on without pausing. What was curious was that at the time in the dream, the words had not made much impression on him. It was only later and by degrees that they had seemed to take on significance. He could not now remember whether it was before or after having the dream that he had seen O'Brien for the first time, nor could he remember when he had first identified the voice as O'Brien's. But at any rate, the identification existed. It was O'Brien who had spoken to him out of the dark. Winston had never been able to feel sure. 
Even after this morning's flash of the eyes, it was still impossible to be sure. Whether O'Brien was a friend or an enemy. Nor did it even seem to matter greatly. There was a link of understanding between them more important than affection or partisanship. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness, he had said. Winston did not know what it meant. Only that in some way or another, it would come true. A voice from the telescreen paused. A trumpet call, clear and beautiful, floated into the stagnant air. The voice continued raspingly. Attention! Your attention, please. A news flash has this moment arrived from the Malabar front. Our forces in South India have won a glorious victory. I'm authorized to say that the action we are now reporting may well bring the war within a measurable distance of its end. Here is a news flash. Bad news coming, thought Winston. And sure enough, following on a gory description of an annihilation of the Eurasian army, with stupendous figures of killed and prisoners, came the announcement that, as from next week, the chocolate ration will be reduced from 30 grams to 20. Winston belched again. The gin was wearing it off, leaving a deflated feeling. The telescreen, perhaps to celebrate the victory, perhaps to drown the memory of the lost chocolate, crashed into Oceania, Tis for thee. You're supposed to stand to it at attention. However, in his present position, he was invisible. Oceania, tis for thee, gave way to lighter music. Winston walked over to the window, keeping his back to the telescreen. The day was still cold and clear. Somewhere far away, a rocket bomb exploded with a dull, reverberating roar. About 20 or 30 of them a week were falling in London at present. Down on the street, the wind flapped on the torn poster to and fro, and the word Ingsoc fitfully appeared and vanished. Ingsoc. The sacred principles of Ingsoc. New speak, double think, the mutability of the past. He felt as though he was wandering the forests of the sea bottom, lost in a monstrous world where he himself was a monster. He was alone. The past was dead. The future was unimaginable. What certainty had he that a single human creature now living was on his side? And what way of knowing that the dominion of the party would not endure forever? Like an answer? The three slogans on the white face of the Minister of Truth came back at him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. He took a 25 cent piece out of his pocket. There too, in tiny clear lettering. The same slogans were inscribed and on the other face of the coin, the head of the big brother. Even from the coin, the eyes pursued you. On coins, on stamps, on the covers of books, on banners, on poster, and on the wrapping of a cigarette packet. Everywhere. Always the eyes watching you and the voice enveloping you. Asleep or awake, working or eating, indoors or out of doors, on the bath or in bed, no escape. Nothing was your own except the few cubic centimeters inside your skull. The sun had shifted round and the mirrored windows of the Ministry of Truth, with the light no longer shining on them, looked grim as loopholes of a fortress. His heart quailed before an enormous pyramidal shape. It was too strong, it could not be stormed. A thousand rocket bombs would not batter it down. He wondered again for whom he was writing the diary. For the future, for the past. For an age that might be imaginary, and in front of him there lay not death but annihilation. The diary would reduce to ashes and himself to vapor. Only the thought police would read what he had written before they wiped it out of existence and out of memory. 
How could you make appeal to the future when not a trace of you, not even an anonymous word scribbled on a piece of paper, could physically survive? The telescreen struck 14. He must leave in 10 minutes. He had to be back at war by 14.30. Curiously, the chiming of the hours seemed to have put new heart into it. He was a lonely ghost uttering a truth that nobody would ever hear. But so long as he uttered it, in some obscure way, the community was not broken. It was not by making yourself heard, but by staying sane that you carried on the human heritage. He went back to the table dipped his pen and wrote to the future or to the past to a time when thought is free when men are different from one another and do not live alone to a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone from the age of uniformity from the age of solitude from the age of big brother from the age of double dink greetings he was already dead, he reflected. It seemed to him that it was only now when he had begun to be able to formulate his thoughts that he had taken the decisive step. The consequence of every act are included in the act itself, he wrote. Thought crime does not entail death. Thought crime is death. Now that he had recognized himself as a dead man, it became important to stay alive as long as possible. Two fingers of his right hand were instinct. It was exactly the kind of detail that might betray you. Some nosy zealot in the ministry, a woman probably. Someone like the little sandy-haired woman or the dark-haired girl from the fiction department. Might start wondering why he had been writing during the lunch interval, why he had used an old-fashioned pen, what he had been writing and then drop a hint in the appropriate quarter. He went to the bathroom and carefully scrubbed the ink away with the gray dark brown soap which rasped her skin like sandpaper and was therefore well adapted for this purpose. He put the diary away in the drawer. It was quite useless to think of hiding it but he could at least make sure whether or not its existence had been discovered. A hair laid across the page ends was too obvious. With a tip of his finger, he picked up an identifiable grain of whitish dust and deposited it on the corner of the cover, where it was bound to be shaken off if a book was moved. Winston was dreaming of his mother. He must, he thought had been ten or eleven years old when his mother had disappeared. She was a tall, statuesque, rather silent woman with slow movements and a magnificent fair hair. His father he remembered more vaguely, as dark and thin, dressed always in neat dark clothes. Winston remembered especially the thin soles of his father's shoes, and wearing spectacles. The two of them must evidently have been swallowed up in one of the first great plurges of the fifties. At this moment, his mother was sitting in some place deep down beneath him, with his young sister in his arms. He did not remember his sister at all, except as tiny, feeble baby, always silent with large, watchful eyes. Both of them were looking up at him. They were down in some subterranean place, the bottom of a well, for instance, or a very deep grave. But it was a place which, already far below him, was itself moving downwards. They were in the saloon of a sinking ship, looking up at him through the darkening water. There was still air in the saloon. They could still see him and he them. But all the while they were sinking down, down into the green waters which in another moment must hide them from sight forever. He was out in the light and the air while they were being sucked down to death. And they were down there because he was up here. 
He knew it, and they knew it. And he could see the knowledge in their faces. There was no reproach, either in the faces or in their hearts. Only the knowledge that they must die in order that he might remain alive. And that this was part of the unavoidable order of things. He could not remember what had happened, but he knew in his dream that in some way the lives of his mother and his sister had been sacrificed to his own. It was one of those dreams which, while retaining the characteristic dream scenery, are a continuation of one's intellectual life, and in which one becomes aware of facts and ideas which still seem new and valuable after one is awake. The thing that now suddenly struck Winston was now that his mother's death, nearly thirty years ago, had been tragic and sorrowful in a way that was no longer possible. Tragedy, he perceived, belonged to the ancient time, to a time when there was still privacy, love, and friendship, and when the members of a family stood by one another without needing to know the reason. His mother's memory tore at his heart because she had died loving him, when he was too young and selfish to love her in return, and because somehow he did not remember how. She had sacrificed herself to a conception of loyalty that was private and unalterable. Such things, he saw, could not happen today. Today there were fear, hatred, and pain, but no dignity of emotion, no deep or complex sorrows. All this he seemed to see in the large eyes of his mother and his sister, looking up at him through the green water, hundreds of fathoms down and still thinking. Suddenly he was standing on a short springy turf, on a summer evening when the slanting rays of the sun guided the ground. The landscape that he was looking at recurred so often in his dreams that he was never fully certain whether or not he had seen it in the real world. In his waking thoughts, he called it the Golden Country. It was an old, rabbit-bitten pasture, with a foot track wandering across it and a mole here, and a mole hill here and there, and the ragged hedge. On the opposite side of the field, the boughs of the elm trees were swaying very faintly in the breeze, their leaves just stirring in dense masses like woman's hair. Somewhere near at hand, though out of sight, there was a clear, slow-moving stream where Dace was streaming, was swimming, in the pools under the willow trees. The girl with dark hair was coming toward him across the field. With what seemed a single movement, she tore off her clothes and flung them disdainfully aside. Her body was wet and smooth, but it aroused no desire in him. Indeed, he barely looked at it. What overwhelmed him in that instant was admiration for the gesture which we had thrown off her clothes aside. With its grace and carelessness, it seemed to annihilate a whole culture, a whole system of thought, as though Big Brother and the party and the thought police would all be swept into nothingness by a single splendid movement of the arm. That too was a gesture belonging to the ancient time. Winston woke up with a sword with the word Shakespeare on his lips. The telescreen was giving forth an ear-splitting whistle which continued on the same note for 30 seconds. It was now at 7.15, getting up time for office workers. Winston wrenched his body out of bed. Naked, for a member of the outer party received only 3,000 clothing coupons annually and a suit of pajamas was six hundred, and seized a dingy singlet and a pair of shorts that were lying across a chair. The physical jerks would begin in three minutes. The next moment he was doubled up by a violent coughing fit which nearly always attacked him soon after waking up. It emptied his lungs so completely that he could only begin breathing again by lying on his back and taking a series of deep gasps. His veins had swelled with the effort of the cough, and the varicose ulcer had started itching. Thirty to forty group yapping a piercing female voice. 
30 to 40 group. Take your places, please. 30s to 40s. Winston sprang to attention in Fort Frontler's telescreen, upon which the image of a youngish woman, scrawny but muscular, dressed in a tunic and gym shoes, had already appeared. Arms bending and stretching, she rapped out. Take your time by me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Come on, comrades, put a bit of life into it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The pain of the coughing fit had not quite driven out of Winston's mind, and the impression made by his dream and the rhythmic movements of the exercise restored him somewhat. As he mechanically shot his arms back and forth, wearing on his face a look of grim enjoyment, which is considered proper during the physical jerks. He was struggling to think his way backward into the dim period of his early childhood. It was extraordinarily different. Beyond the late fifties, everything faded. When there were no external records that you could refer to, or even the outline of your own life lost its shapeness. You remembered huge events which had quite probably not happened. You remember the detail of incidents without being able to recapture the atmosphere. And there were long break periods, which you could assign nothing. Everything happened different then. Even the names of countries and their shapes on the map happened different. Airstrip 1, for instance, had not been so called in those days. It had been called England or Britain, the London, he felt fairly certain had always been called London. Winston could not definitely remember a time when his country had not been at war, but it was evident that there had been a fairly long interval of peace during his childhood, because one of his early memories was of an air raid which appeared to take everyone by surprise. Perhaps there was a time when the atomic bomb had fallen on Colchester. He did not remember the raid itself, but he did remember his father's hand clutching his own as he hurried down, down, down into some place, deep in the earth, round and round a spiral suitcase which rang under his feet and which finally wearied his legs, that he began whimpering and they had to stop and rest. His mother, in her slow, dreamy way, was following a long way behind them. She was carrying his baby sister or perhaps it was only a bundle of blankets that she was carrying. He was not certain whether his sister had been born then. Finally, they had emerged into a noisy, crowded place which he, which he had realized to be a tube station. There were people sitting all over the stone-flaked floor, and other people, packed tightly together, were sitting on metal bunks, one above the other. Winston and his mother and father found themselves a place on the floor, and near them an old man and an old woman were sitting side by side on a bunk. The old man had on a decent dark suit and a black cloth cap, pushed back from very white hair. His face was scarlet, and his eyes were blue and full of tears. He reeked of gin. It seemed to breathe out of his skin in place of sweat, and one could have fancied the tears welling from his eyes were pure gin. But though slightly drunk he was, also suffering under some grief, that was genuine and unbearable. In his childish way, Winston grasped some terrible thing, something that was beyond forgiveness and could not be remedied, had just happened. It also seemed to him that he knew what it was, Someone whom the old man loved, a little granddaughter perhaps, had been killed. Every few minutes, the old man kept repeating. We didn't ought to have trusted them. I said so, ma, didn't I? That's what come of trusting them. I said so all along. We didn't ought to have trusted the buggers. But which buggers they didn't ought to have trusted Winston could not now remember. Since about that time... War had been literally continuous, though strictly speaking it had not always been in the same war. For several months during his childhood, 
there have been confused street fighting in London itself, some of which we remembered vividly. But to trace out the history of the whole period, to say who was fighting whom at any given moment, would have been utterly impossible since no written record and no spoken word ever made it mention of any other alignment than the existing one. At this moment, for example, in 1984, if it was 1984, Oceania was at war with Eurasia in an alliance with East Asia. In no public or private utterance was it ever admitted that the three powers had any time been grouped along different lines. Actually, as Winston well knew, it was only four years since Oceania had been at war with East Asia in an alliance with Eurasia. But that was merely a piece of furtive knowledge which he happened to possess because his memory was not satisfactorily under control. Officially, the change of partners had never happened. Oceania was at war with Eurasia. Therefore, Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia. The enemy of the moment always represented absolute evil, and it followed that any past or future agreement with him was impossible. The frightening thing, he reflected for the ten thousandth time, as he forged his shoulders painfully backward, with hands on hips, they were gyrating their bodies from the waist, an exercise that was supposed to be good for the back muscles. The frightening thing was that it might all be true. If a party could trust his hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened. That, surely, was more terrifying than mere torture and death. The party said that Oceania had never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceania had been in alliance with Eurasia as short a time as four years ago. But where did that alliance exist? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case must soon be annihilated. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past? Round the party slogan. Controls the future. Who controls the present? Controls the past. And yet the past, though of its nature alterable, had never been altered. Whatever was true now was true from everlasting to everlasting. It was quite simple. All that was needed was an, an unending series of victories over your own memory. Reality control, they called it. In new speak, double think. Stand easy, barked the instructress, a little more genuinely. Winston sank his arms to his sides and slowly refilled his lungs with air. His mind slid away into the labyrinth world of double think. To know and not to know, to be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies, to hold simultaneously two opinions which cancelled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them, to use logic against logic, to repudiate morality while laying claim to it, to believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was a guardian of democracy, to forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed and then promptly to forget it again. And above all, to apply the same process to the process itself. That was the ultimate subtlety. Consciously to induce unconsciousness, and then once again, to become unconscious of the act of hypnosis you had just performed. Even to understand the word double think involved the use of double think. The instructress had called into attention again, and now let's see which of us can touch her toes, she said enthusiastically. Right over from the hips, please, comrades. One, two, one, two. Winston loathed this exercise, which sent shooting pains all the way from his heels to his buttocks, and often ended by bringing on another coughing fit. The half-pleasant quality went out of his meditations. The past, he reflected, had not merely been altered, it had been actually destroyed. For how could you establish even the most obvious fact when there exists no record outside your own memory? 
he tried to remember in what year he had first heard of mention of Big Brother. He thought it must have been at the same time in the 60s, but it was impossible to be certain. In the party history, of course, Big Brother figured as a leader and guardian of the revolution since its very earliest days. His exploits have been gradually pushed backwards in time until already they extended into the fabulous world of the 40s and the 30s, when the capitalists in their strange cylindrical hats still rode through the streets of London in great, great gleaming think. In great gleaming motor cars or horse carriages with glass sides. There was no knowing how much of this legend was true and how much invented. Winston could not even remember at what date the party itself had come into before 1960. He did not believe he had ever heard of the word Ingsoc before 1960, but it was impossible that, in its old speak form, English socialism, that is to say, it had been current earlier. Everything melted into mist. Sometimes, indeed, you could put your finger on a definite lie. It was not true, for example, as was claimed in the party history books, that the party had invented airplanes. He remembered airplanes since its earliest childhood, but you could prove nothing. There was never any evidence. Just once in his whole life he had held in his hands unmistakable documentary proof of the falsification of a historical fact. And on that occasion, Smith! Screamed the shrewdest voice of the telescreen. Winston looked round the shabby little room above Mr. Charrington's shop. Beside the window, the enormous bed was made up with ragged blankets and coverless bolster. The old fashioned clock with a 12 hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. In the corner, on the gate like table, the glass paperweight, which he had bought on his last visit, gleamed softly out of a half-darkness. In the fender was a battered tin oil stove, a saucepan and two cups, provided by Mr. Sherrington. Winston lit the burner and set a pan of water to boil. He had brought an envelope full of victory coffee and some saccharine tablets. The clock's hand said 7.20. It was 1920, really. She was coming at 1930. Fully, fully, his heart kept saying. Conscious, gratuitous, suicidal fully. Of all the crimes that a party member could commit, this one was the least possible to conceal. Actually, the idea had first floated into his mind in the form of a vision of a glass paperweight mirrored by the surface of a gate lake table. As he had foreseen, Mr. Sherrington had made no difficulty about letting the room. He was obviously glad of a few dollars that it would bring him. Nor did he seem shocked or become offensively, knowing when it was made clear that Winston wanted the room for the purpose of a love affair. Instead, he looked into the middle distance and spoke in generalities with so delicate an air as to give the impression that he had become partly invisible. Privacy, he said, was a very valuable thing. Everyone wanted a place where they could be alone occasionally. And when they had such a place, it was only common courtesy in anyone else who knew of it to keep his knowledge to himself. He even, seeming almost to fade out of existence as he did so, added that there were two entries to the house, one of them through the backyard, which gave on an alley. Under the window, somebody was singing. Winston peeped out, secure the protection of the muslin carton. The June sun was still high in the sky, and in the sun-filled court below, a monstrous woman, solid as a Norman pillar, with his brawny red forearms and a sagging apron strapped about her middle, was stumping to and fro between the wash tub and a clothesline, pegging at a series of square white things which Winston recognized as baby's diapers. Whenever her mouth was not corked with clothes, 
She was singing in a powerful contra, contra alto. It was an opless fancy. It passed like an eyebrow eye. But look at a word. All the dreams they stirred. They have stolen my earth. Ah. The tune had been haunting London for weeks past. It was one of countless similar songs published for the benefit of the Prolies by a subsection of the music department. The words of these songs were composed without any human intervention, whatever, on an instrument known as a versificator. While the woman sang so tunefully as to turn the dreadful rubbish into an almost pleasant sound, he could hear the woman singing in the scrape of her shoes on the flagstones and the cries of the children in the street, and somewhere in the far distance a faint roar of traffic, and yet the room seemed curiously silent, thanks to the absence of a telescreen. Fully, 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 he thought again. It was inconceivable that they could frequent this place for more than a few weeks without being caught. But the temptation of having a high place that was truly their own, indoors and near at hand, had been too much for both of them. For some time after their visit to the church belfry, it had been impossible to arrange meetings. Working hours had been drastically increased in anticipation of hate week. It was more than a month distant, but the enormous complex preparations that it entailed were throwing extra work onto everybody. Finally, both of them managed to secure a free afternoon on the same day. They had agreed to get back to the clearing in the wood. On the evening beforehand, they met briefly in the street. As usual, Winston hardly looked at Julia as they drifted toward one another in the crowd, but from the short glance he gave her, it seemed to him that she was paler than usual. It's all off. She murmured as soon as she judged it safe to speak. Tomorrow, I mean. What? Tomorrow afternoon. I can't come. Why not? Oh, the usual reason. It started early this time. For a moment, he was violently angry. During the month that he had known her, the nature of his desire for her had changed. At the beginning, there had been a little true sensuality in it. Their first lovemaking had been simply an act of the will. But after the second time, it was different. The smell of her hair, the taste of her mouth, the feeling of her skin seemed to have got inside him, or into the air all round him. She had become a physical necessity, something that he not only wanted, but felt that he had a right to. When she said that she could not come, he had the feeling that she was cheating him. But just at this moment, the crowd pressed them together and their hands accidentally met. She gave the tips of his fingers a quick squeeze that seemed to invite not desire but affection. It struck him that when one lived with a woman, this particular disappointment must be a normal, recurring event. And a deep tenderness, such as he had not felt for her before, suddenly took hold of him. He wished that they were married couple of ten years standing. He wished that he were talk walking through the streets with her just as they were doing now, but openly and without fear, talking of trivialities and buying odds and ends for the household. He wished above all that they had some place where they could be alone together without feeling the obligation to make love every time they met. It was not actually at the moment, but at some time on the following day, that the idea of renting Mr. Sherrington's room had occurred to him. When he suggested it to Julia, she had agreed with unexpected readiness. Both of them knew that it was lunacy. It was as though they were intentionally stepping nearer to their graves. As he sat waiting on the edge of the bed, he thought again of the cellars of the Ministry of Love. It was curious how that predestined horror moved in and out of one's consciousness. There it lay, fixed in future time, preceding death as surely as 99 precedes 100. One could not avoid it, but one could perhaps postpone it. And yet instead, every now and again, 
by a conscious, willful act, one chose to shorten the interval before it happened. At this moment, there was a quick step on the stairs. Julia burst into the room. She was carrying a tool bag of coarse brown canvas, such as he had sometimes seen her carrying to and fro at the ministry. He started forward to take her in his arms, but she disengaged herself rather hurriedly, partly because she was still holding the tool bag. Half a second, she said. Just let me show you what I've brought. Did you bring some of that filthy victory coffee? I thought you would. You can chuck it away again because we shan't be needing it. Look here. She fell her knees, threw open the bag, and tumbled out some spanners and a screwdriver that filled the top part of it. Underneath was a number of neat paper packets. The first packet that she passed to Winston had a strange and yet vaguely familiar feeling. It was filled with some kind of heavy, sand-like stuff which yielded whatever you touched it. It isn't sugar, he said. Real sugar, not saccharine sugar. And here's a loaf of bread. Proper white bread, not our bloody stuff. And a little pot of jam. And here's a tin of milk. But look, this is the one I'm really proud of. I had to wrap a bit of sacking round because... But she did not need to tell him why she had wrapped it up. The smell was already filling the room, a rich hot smell which seemed like an emanation from his early childhood, but which one did occasionally meet when even how, blowing down a passageway before a door slammed, or diffusing itself mysteriously in a crowded street, sniffed for an instant and then lost again. It's coffee, he murmured. Real coffee. It's inner party coffee. There's a whole kilo here, she said. How did you manage to get hold of all these things? It's all inner party stuff. There's nothing those swines don't have, nothing. But of course, waiters and servants and people pinch things. And look, I got a little packet of tea as well. Winston had squatted down beside her. He tore open a corner of the packet. It's real tea, not blackberry leaves. There's been a lot of tea about lately. They've captured India or something, she said vaguely. But listen, dear, I want you to turn your back on me for three minutes. Go and sit on the other side of the bed. Don't go too near the window and don't turn around till I tell you. Winston gazed abstractedly through the mu muslin carton. Down in the yard, the red-armed woman was still marching to and fro between the washtub and the knot line. She took two more pegs out of her mouth and sang with deep feeling. She knew the whole driveling song by heart, it seemed. Her voice floated upward with a sweet summer air, very tuneful, charged with a sort of happy melancholy. One of the feeling that she would have been perfectly content if June the evening had been endless and the supply of clothes inexhaustible, to remain there for a thousand years, pegging out diapers and singing rubbish. It struck him as a curious fact that he had never heard a member of the party singing alone and spontaneously. It would even have seemed slightly unorthodox, a dangerous eccentricity, like talking to oneself. Perhaps it was only when people were somewhere near the starvation level that they had anything to sing about. You can turn around now, said Julia. He turned round and for a second almost failed to recognize her. What he had actually expected was to see her naked. But she was not naked. The transformation that happened was much more surprising than that. She had painted her face. She must have slipped into some shop in the proletarian quarters and brought herself a complete set of makeup materials. Her lips were deeply reddened, her cheeks rouged, her nose powdered, there were even a touch of something under the eyes to make them brighter. It was not very skillfully done, but Winston's standards in such matters were not high. He had never before seen or imagined a woman of a party with cosmetics on her face. The improvement in her appearance was startling. With just a few dabs of color in the right places, she had become not only very much prettier, but above all, far more feminine. 
Her short hair and boyish overalls merely added to the effect. As he took her in his arms, a wave of synthetic violets flooded his nostrils. He remembered the half-darkness of basement kitchen and a woman's ca cavernous mouth. It was the very same scent that she had used, but at the moment, it did not seem to matter. Scent too, he said. Yes, dear, scent too. And do you know what I'm going to do next? I'm, to get, I'm going to get a hold of real woman's frock from somewhere and wear it instead of these bloody trousers. I'll wear silk stockings and high-heeled shoes. In this room, I'm going to be a woman, not a party comrade. They flung their clothes off and climbed into the huge mahogany bed. It was the first time that he had stripped himself naked in her presence. Until now, he had been too much ashamed of his pale and meager body, with the varicose veins standing out on his calves and the discolored patch over his ankle. There were no sheets, but the blanket they lay on was threadbare and smooth and the size and springiness of the bed astonished both of them. It's sure to be full of bugs, but who cares, said Julia. One never saw a double bed nowadays, except in the homes of the Prulies. Winston occasionally slept in one in his boyhood. Julia had never been in one before, so far as she could remember. Presently, they fell asleep for a little while. When Winston woke up, the hands of the clock had crept round to nearly nine. He did not stir because Julia was sleeping with her head in the crook of his arm. Most of her makeup had transferred itself to his own face or their both bolster, but a light stain of rouge still brought out the beauty of her cheekbone. A yellow ray from the sinking sun fell across the foot of the bed and lightened up the fireplace where the water in the pan was boiling. Down in the yard, the woman had stopped singing, but the faint shouts of children floated in from the street. He wondered vaguely whether in the abolished past it happened a normal experience to lie in bed like this, in the cool of summer evening, a man and a woman with no clothes on, making love when they chose, talking of what they chose, not feeling any compulsion to get up, simply lying there and listening to peaceful sounds outside. Surely there could never have been a time when that seemed ordinary. Julia woke up, rubbed her eyes, and raised herself from the elbow to look at the oil stove. Half that water's rolled away, she said. I'll get up and make some coffee in another moment. You've got an hour. What time do they cut the lights off at your flats? Twenty-three thirty. It's twenty-three at the hostel, but you have to get in earlier than that because... Hi, get out, you filthy brute. She suddenly twisted herself over in the bed, seized a shoe from the floor, and sent it hurtling into the corner with a boyish jerk of her arm, exactly as he had seen her fling the dictionary at Goldstein that morning during the two minutes' hate. What was it? he said in surprise. A rat. I saw him stick his beastly nose out of a wainscoting. There's a hole down there. I give him a good fright anyway. Rats, murmured Winston. In this room. They're all over the place, said Julia indifferently as she lay down again. We've even got them in the kitchen at the hostel. Some parts, London is swarming with them. Did you know they attack children? Yes, they do. In some of these streets, a woman dares to leave a baby alone for two minutes. It's the huge brown ones that do it. And the nasty thing is that the brutes always... Don't go on, said Winston with his eyes tightly shut. Dearest, you've gone quite pale. What's the matter? Do they make you feel sick? Of all horrors in the world, a rat. She pressed herself against him and wound her arms round him, as though to reassure him with the warmth of her body. He did not reopen his eyes immediately. For several moments, he had had the feeling of being back in nightmare which had recurred from time to time throughout his life. It was always very much the same. He was standing in front of the wall of darkness, and on the other side of it, there was something unendurable, something too dreadful to be placed. In the dream, his deepest feeling was always of the deep deception, because he did in fact know 
What was behind the wall of darkness? With a deadly effort, like wrenching a piece out of his own brain, he could even have dragged the thing into the open. He always woke up without discovering what it was, but somehow was connected with what Julia had been saying when he cut her short. I'm sorry, he said. It's it's nothing. I don't like rats. That's all. Don't worry, dear. We're not going to have the filthy brutes in here. I'll stop the hold a bit of sagging before we go. And next time we come here, I'll bring some plaster and bung it up properly. Already, the black instead of panic was half forgotten. Feeling slightly ashamed of himself, he sat up against the bed head. Julia got out of bed, pulled on her overalls, and made the coffee. The smell that rose from the saucepan was so powerful and exciting that they shut the window lest anybody outside should notice it and become inquisitive. What was even better was that the taste of the coffee, the coffee was a silky texture given to it by the sugar. A thing Winston had almost forgotten after years of saccharin. With one hand in her pocket and a piece of bread and a jam in the other, Julia wandered about the room, glancing indifferently at the bookcase, pointing at the best way of repairing them, plumping herself down the ragged armchair to see if it was uncomfortable, and examining the absurd twelve-hour clock with a sort of tolerant amusement. She brought the glass of paperweight. Over to the bed to have a look at it in a better light. He took it out of her hand, fascinated as always with the soft, rain-watery appearance of the glass. What is it? Do you think? Said Julia. I don't think it's anything. I mean, I don't think it was ever put to any use. That's what I like about it. It's a little chunk of history that I've forgotten to alter. It's a message from a hundred years ago. If one knew how to read it. And that picture over there, she nodded at the engraving on the opposite wall. Would that be a hundred years old? More, two hundred, I, I dare say. One can't tell. It's impossible to discover the age of anything nowadays. She went over to look at it. Here's where that brute stuck his nose out. She said, kicking the wainscoting immediately below the picture. What is this place? I've seen it before somewhere. It's a church, or at least it used to be. Say, Clement Stain, its name was. The fragment of rhyme that Mister Sherrington had taught him came back into his head, and he added half nostalgically. Oranges and lemons say the bells of Saint Clement's. To his astonishment, she capped the line. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of Saint Martin's. When will you pay me? Said the bells of Old Bailey. I can't remember how it goes on after that, but anyway, I remember it ends up. Here comes a candle to light your light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was like the two halves of a countersign, but there must be another line af after the bells of Old Bailey. Perhaps. It could be dug out of Mister Sherrington's memory if he were suitably prompted. Who taught you that? He said, "My grandfather. He used to say it to me when I was a little girl. He was vaporized when I was eight. At any rate, he disappeared. I wonder what a lemon was." She added inconsequently, "I've seen oranges. They're a kind of round yellow fruit with a thick skin." I can remember lemons," said Winston. They were quite common in the fifties. They were so sour that it set your teeth on edge, even to smell them. I bet the pictures got bots behind it," said Julia. "I'll take it down and give it a good clean some day. I suppose it's almost time we are leaving. I must start washing this paint off. What a bore! I'll get the lipstick off your face afterwards." Weston did not get up for a few minutes more. The room was darkening. He turned over toward the light and lay gazing into the glass paperweight. The inexhaustibly interesting thing was not the fragment of coral, but the interior of the glass itself. There was such a depth of it, and yet it was almost as transparent as air. It was as though the surface of the glass had been the arc of the sky, enclosing a tiny world with its atmosphere complete. He had a feeling that he could get inside it. 
and that in fact he was inside it along with the mahogany bed and the gate lake table and the clock and the steel engraving and the paperweight itself. The paperweight was a room he was in, and the coral was Julia's life and his own, fixed in a sort of eternity at the heart of a crystal. Sign had vanished. A morning came, and he was missing from work. A few thoughtless people commented on his absence. On the next day, nobody mentioned him. On the third day, Winston went into the vestibule of the records department to look at the notice board. One of the notices carried a printed list of the members of the chess committee of whom Syme had been one. It looked almost exactly as it had looked before. Nothing had been crossed out, but it was one name shorter. It was enough. Syme had ceased to exist. He had never existed. The weather was baking hot. In the labyrinth ministry, the wi windowless, air-conditioned rooms kept their normal temperature, but outside the pavement scorched one's feet, and the stench of the tubes at the rush hours was a horror. The preparations for hate week were a full swing, and the staffs of all the ministries were working overtime. Processions, meetings, military parades, lectures, waxwork displays, film shows, telescreen programs all had to be organized. Stands had to be erected, effigies built, slogans coined, songs written, rumors circulated, photographs faked. Julia's unit in the fiction department had been taken off the production of novels and was rushing out a series of atrocity pamphlets. Winston, in addition to his regular work, spent long periods every day in going through back files of the times and altering and embellishing news items which were to be quoted in speeches. Late at night, when crowds of rowdy prolies roamed the streets, the town had a curiously fra febrile air. The rocket bombs crashed oftener than ever, and sometimes in the far distance there were enormous explosions which no one could explain and about which there were riled rumors. A new tune which was to be the theme song of Hate Week, the Hate Song it was called, had already been composed and was being endlessly plugged on the telescreens. It had a savage, barking rhythm which could not exactly be called music, but resembled the beating of a drum. Roared out by hundreds of voices to the tra tramp of marching feet, it was terrifying. The Prolies had taken a fancy to it, and in the midnight streets it competed with still popular, it was only a hopeless fancy. The Parsons' children played it at all hours of the night and day, unbearably on a comb and a piece of toilet paper. Winston's evening were fuller than ever. Squads of volunteers organized by Parsons were preparing the street for hate week, stitching banners, painting posters, erecting flagstaffs on the roofs, and perilously slinging wires across the street for the reception of streamers. Parsons boasted that Victory Mansions alone would display 400 meters of bunting. He was in his native element and as happy as a lark. The heat and the manual work had even given him a pretext for reverting to shorts and an open shirt in the evenings. He was everywhere at once, pushing, pulling, sawing, hammering, improvising, jollying everyone along with comradely exhortations and giving out from every fold of his body what seemed an inexhaustible supply of acrid smelling sweat. A new poster had suddenly appeared all over London. It had no caption and represented simply the monstrous figure of a Eurasian soldier, three or four meters high, striding forward with expressionless Mongolian face and enormous boots, a submachine gun pointed from his hip. From whatever angle you looked at the poster, the muzzle of a gun, magnified by the foreshortening, seemed to be pointed straight at you. The thing had been plastered on every blank space, on every wall, even outnumbering the portraits of Big Brother. The 
normally apathetic about the war, were being lashed into one of their periodical frenzies of patriotism. As though to harmonize with the general mood, the rocket bombs had been killing larger numbers of people than usual. One fell on a crowded film theater in Stepney, burying several hundred victims among the ruins. The whole population of the neighborhood turned out for a long, trailing funeral which went for hours and was in effect an indignation meeting. Another bomb fell on a piece of waste ground which was used as a playground and several dozen children were blown to pieces. There were further angry demonstrations. Goldstein was burned in effigy. Hundreds of copies of a poster of a Eurasian soldier were torn down and added to the flames and a number of shops were looted in the turmoil. Then a rumor flew around that spies were directing the rocket bombs by means of wireless waves, and an old couple who were suspected of being the foreign ex extraction had their house set on fire and perished of suffocation. In the room of Mr. Sherrington's shop, where they could get there, Julia and Winston lay side by side on a stripped bed under an open window, naked for the sake of coolness. The rat had never come back, but the bugs had multiplied hideously in the heat. It did not seem to matter. Dirty or clean, the room was paradise. As soon as they arrived, they would sprinkle everything with pepper bought on the black market, tear off their clothes and make love with sweating bodies, then fall asleep and wake to find that the bugs had rallied and were massing for a counterattack. Four, five, six, seven times they met during the month of June. Winston had dropped his habit of drinking gin at all hours. He seemed to have lost the need for it. He had grown fatter. His varicose ulcer had subsided, leaving only a brown stain on the skin above his ankle with fits of coughing in the early morning had stopped. The process of life had ceased to be intolerable. He had no longer any impulses to make faces at the telescreen or shout curses at the top of his voice. Now that they had a secure hiding place, almost a home, it did not even seem a hardship that they could only meet infrequently and for a couple of hours at a time. What mattered was that the room over the junk shop should exist. To know what it was there, in Violet, was almost the same as being in it. The room was a world, a pocket of the past where extinct, extinct animals could walk. Mr. Sheraton thought Winston, was another extinct animal. He usually stopped to talk with Mr. Sheraton for a few minutes on his way upstairs. The old man seemed seldom or never to go out of doors, and on the other hand to have almost no customers. He led a ghost-like existence between the tiny dark shop and even tinier back kitchen where he prepared his meals and which contained, among other things, an unbelievably ancient gramophone with an enormous horn. He seemed glad of the opportunity to talk. Wandering about among his worthless stock, with his long nose and thick spectacles and his bowed shoulders and the velvet jacket, he had always vaguely the air of being a collector rather than a tradesman. With a short of faded enthusiasm, you fingerous scrap of rubbish or that. A china bottle stopper, the painted lid of a broken snuff box a pinchback locket containing a strand of some long-dead baby's hair, never asking that Winston should buy it, merely that he should admire it. To talk to him was like listening to the tinkling of a worn-out musical box. He had dragged out from the corners of his memory some of fragments of forgotten rhymes. There was one about four and twenty blackbirds, and another about a cow with a crumpled horn, and another about the death of poor Cock Robin. It just occurred to me you might be interested, he would say with a deprecating little laugh, whenever he produced a little fragment. But he could never recall more than a few lines of any one rhyme. Both of them knew, in a way, it was never out of their minds, that what was happening could not last long. There are times when the fact of impending death seems as palpable as the bed they lay on, and they would cling together with a sort of despairing sensuality, like a damned soul grasping at his last morsel of pleasure when the clock is within five minutes of striking. But there were also times when they had the illusion not only of safety but of 
permanence. So long as they were actually in this room, they both felt no harm could come to them. Getting there was difficult and dangerous, but the room itself was sanctuary. It was as when Winston had gazed into the heart of the paperweight, with a feeling that it would be possible to get inside that glassy world, and that once inside, it, time could be arrested. Often they gave themselves up to daydreams of escape. Their luck would hold indefinitely, and they would carry on their intrigue, just like this, for the remainder of their natural lives. Or Catherine would die, and by subtle maneuverings, Winston and Julia could succeed in getting married. Or they would commit suicide together. Or they would disappear, alter themselves out of recognition, learn to speak with proletarian accents, get jobs in a factory, and live out their lives undetected in a back street. It was all nonsense, as they both knew. In reality, there was no escape. Even the one plan that was pr practicable, suicide, they had no intention of carrying out. To hang on from day to day and from week to week, spitting out a present that had no future, seemed an unconquerable instinct, just as one's lungs will always draw the next breath so as there is air available. There's a table over there, under that telescreen, said Syme. Let's pick up a gin on the way. The gin was served out to them in handless china mugs. They threaded their way across the crowded room and unpacked their trays onto the metal-topped table, on one corner of which someone had left a pool of stew, a filthy liquid mess that had the appearance of vomit. Winston took up his mug of gin, paused for an instant to collect his nerve, and gulped the oily-tasting stuff down. When he had winked the tears out of his eyes, he suddenly discovered that he was hungry. He began swallowing spoonfuls of a stew, which, in among its general sloppiness, had cubes of spongy, pinkish stuff, which was probably a preparation of meat. Neither of them spoke again, till they had emptied their pannikins. From the table at Winston's left, a little behind his back, someone was talking rapidly and continuously, a harsh gabble, almost like the quacking of a duck, which pierced the general uproar of the room. "'How's the dictionary getting on?' said Winston, raising his voice to overcome the noise." Slowly, said Syme. I'm on the adjectives. It's fascinating. He had brightened up immediately at the mention of newspeak. He pushed his pannikin aside, took up his hunk of bread in one delicate hand and his cheese on the other, and leaned across the table so as to be able to speak without shouting. The 11th edition is the definitive edition, he said. We're getting the language into its final shape, the shape it's going to have when nobody speaks anything else. When we've finished with it, people like you will have to learn it all over again. You think, I dare say, that our chief job is inventing new words. But not a bit of it. We're destroying words. Scores of them, hundreds of them, every day. We're cutting the language down to the bone. The 11th edition won't contain a single word that will become obsolete before the year 2050. He bit hungrily onto his bread and swallowed a couple of mouthfuls and continued speaking with a sort of pedant's passion. His thin, dark face had become animated. His eyes had lost their mocking expression and grown almost dreamy. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Of course, the great wastage is in the verbs and adjectives, but there are hundreds of nouns that can be got rid of as well. It isn't only the synonyms, there are also the antonyms. After all, what justification is there for a word which is simply the opposite of some other word? 
A word contains its opposite in itself. Take good, for instance. If you have a word like good, what need is there for a word like bad? Ungood will do just as well. Better, because it's an exact opposite, which the other is not. Or again, if you want a stronger version of good, what sense of it is there in having a whole string of vague, useless words like excellent and splendid and all the rest of them? Plus good covers the meaning, or double plus good if you want something stronger still. Of course, we use those forms already, but in the final version of Newspeak, there will be nothing else. In the end, the whole notion of goodness and badness will be covered by only six words. In reality, only one word. Don't you see that beauty of that, Winston? It was BB's idea originally, of course, he added as an afterthought. A sort of vapid eagerness flitted across Winston's face at the mention of Big Brother. Nevertheless, Sami immediately detected a certain lack of enthusiasm. You haven't a real appreciation of Newspeak, Winston, he said, almost sadly. Even when you write it, you're still thinking in old speak. I've read some of those pieces that you write in the Times occasionally. They're good enough, but they're translations. In your heart, you prefer to stick to old speak with all its vagueness and its useless shades of meaning. You don't grasp the beauty of the destruction of words. Do you know that Newspeak is the only language in the world whose vocabulary gets smaller every year? Winston did know that, of course. He smiled, sympathetically, he hoped, not trusting himself to speak. Sime bit off another fragment of the dark-colored bread, chewed it briefly, and went on. Don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible, because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word, with its meaning rigidly defined and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Already, in the 11th edition, we're not far from that point. But the process will still be continuing long after you and I are dead. Every year, fewer and fewer words, and the range of consciousness always get a little smaller. Even now, of course, there's no reason or excuse for committing thought crime. It's merely a question of self-discipline, reality control. But in the end, there won't be any need even for that. The revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. Newspeak is Inksock, and Inksock is Newspeak, he added with a sort of mystical satisfaction. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, that by the year 2050, at the very latest, not a single human being will be alive who could understand such a conversation as we're having now? Except, began Winston doubtfully, and then stopped. It had been on the tip of his tongue to say, except the proleys, but he checked himself, not feeling fully certain that this remark was not in some way unorthodox. Syme, however, had divined what he was about to say, the Prolies are not human beings, he said carelessly. By 2050 earlier, probably, all real knowledge of old speak will have disappeared. The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron. They'll exist only in new speak versions, not merely changed into something different but actually changed into something contradictory of what they used to be. 
Even the literature of the party will change. Even the slogans will change. How could you have a slogan like freedom is slavery when the concept of freedom has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. One of these days, thought Winston with sudden deep conviction, Syme will be vaporized. He's too intelligent. He sees too clearly and speaks too plainly. The party does not like such people. One day he will disappear. It is written in his face. Winston had finished his bread and cheese. He turned a little sideways in his chair to drink his mug of coffee. At the table on his left, the man with a strident voice was still talking remorselessly away. A young woman, who was perhaps his secretary, and who was sitting with her back to Winston, was listening to him and seemed to be eagerly agreeing with everything that he had said. From time to time, Winston caught some such remark as, I think you're so right, I do so agree with you, uttered in a youthful and rather silly feminine voice. But the other voice never stopped for an instant, even when the girl was speaking. Winston knew the man by sight, though he knew no more about him than that he had held some important post in the fiction department. He was a man of about thirty, with a muscular throat and a large mobile mouth. His head was thrown back a little, and because of the angle at which he was sitting, his spectacles caught the light and presented to Winston two blank discs instead of eyes. What was slightly horrible was that, from the stream of sound that poured out of his mouth, it was almost impossible to distinguish a single word. Just once, Winston caught a phrase, complete and final elimination of Goldsteinism, jerked out very rapidly and, as it seemed, all in one piece, like a line of type cast solid. For the rest, it was just a noise, a quack quack quacking. And yet, though you could not actually hear what the man was saying, you could not be in any doubt about his general nature. He might be denouncing Goldstein and demanding sterner measures against thought criminals and saboteurs. He might be fulminating against the atrocities of the Eurasian army. He might be praising Big Brother or the heroes on the Malibur front. It made no difference. Whatever it was, you could be certain that every word, it was pure orthodoxy, pure inksock. As he watched the eyeless face with a jaw moving rapidly up and down, Winston had a curious feeling that this was not a real human being, but some kind of dummy. It was not the man's brain that was speaking, it was his larynx. The stuff that was coming out of his mouth consisted of words, but it was not speech in the true sense. It was a noise uttered in unconsciousness, like the quacking of a duck. Syme had fallen silent for a moment, and with the handle of his spoon was tracing patterns in the puddle of stew. The voice from the other table quacked rapidly on, easily audible in spite of the surrounding din. There is a word in Newspeak, said Syme. I don't know whether you know it. Duck speak. To quack like a duck. It is one of those interesting words that have two contradictory meanings. Apply to it an opposite. It is abuse. Apply to someone you agree with. It's praise. Unquestionably, Syme will be vaporized, Winston thought again. 
He thought it with a kind of sadness, although well knowing that Syme despised him and slightly disliked him, and was fully capable of denouncing him as a thought criminal if he saw any reason for doing so. There was something subtly wrong with Syme. There was something that he lacked. Discretion. Aloofness. A sort of saving stupidity. You could not say that he was unorthodox. He believed in the principle of Inksock. He venerated Big Brother. He rejoiced over victories. He hated heretics, and not merely with sincerity, but with a sort of restless seal. An up-to-dateness of info, which the ordinary party member did not approach. Yet a faint air of disreputability always clung to him. He said things that would have been better unsaid. He had read too many books. He frequented the Chestnut Tree Cafe, haunt of painters and musicians. There was no law, not even an unwritten law, against frequenting the Chestnut Tree Cafe. Yet the place was somehow ill omened. The old discredited leaders of a party had been used to gather there before they were finally purged. Goldstein himself, it was said, had sometimes been seen there years and decades ago. Syme's fate was not difficult to foresee, and yet it was a fact that if Syme grasped, even for three seconds, the nature of his, Winston's, secret opinions, he would betray him instantly to the thought police. So would anybody else, for that matter, but Syme more than most. Zeal was not enough. Orthodoxy was unconsciousness. Syme looked up. Here comes Parsons, he said. Summing the tone of his voice seemed to add, that bloody fool. Parsons, Winston's fellow tenant at Victory Mansions, was in fact threading his way across the room. Tubby, middle-sized man with fair hair and frog-like face. At 35, he was already putting on rolls of fat at neck and waistline, but his movements were brisk and boyish. His whole appearance was that of a little boy grown large, so much so that although he was wearing the regulation overalls, it was almost impossible not to think of him as being dressed in the blue shorts, grey shirt, and red neckerchief of the spies. In visualizing him, one saw always a picture of dimpled knees and sleeves rolled back from pudgy forearms. Parsons did indeed invariably revert to shorts, when a community hike or any other physical activity gave him an excuse for doing so. He greeted them both with a cheery hello hello and sat down on the table, giving off an intense smell of sweat. Beads of moisture stood out all over his pink face. His powers of sweating were extraordinary. At the community center, you could always tell when he had been playing table tennis by the dampness of a bat handle. Syme had produced a strip of paper on which there was a long column of words and was studying it with an ink pencil between his fingers. Look at him working away in the lunch hour, said Parsons, nudging Winston. Keenness, eh? What side you've got there, old boy? Something a bit too brainy for me, I expect. Smith, old boy, I tell you why I'm chasing you. It's that sub you forgot to give me. Which sub is that? asked Winston, automatically feeling for money. About a quarter of one's salary had to be earmarked for voluntary subscriptions, which were so numerous that it was difficult to keep track of them. For hate week, you know, the house-by-house -house fund, 
I'm treasurer for our block. We're making an all-out effort. Going to put on a tremendous show. I tell you, it won't be my fault if old Victory Mansions doesn't have the biggest outfit of flags in the whole street. Two dollars, you promised me. Winston found and handed over two crees and filthy notes, which Parsons entered in a small notebook in the neat handwriting of the illiterate. By the way, old boy, he said, I hear that little beggar of mine let fly at you with his catapults yesterday. I gave him a good dressing down for it. In fact, I told him I'd take the catapult away if he does it again. I think he was a little upset at not going to the execution, said Winston. Ah, well, what I mean to say shows the right spirit, doesn't it? Mischievous little beggars they are, both of them. But talk about keenness. All they think about is the spies and the war, of course. Do you know that little girl of mine did last Saturday when her troop was on a hike out Burkham said way? She got two other girls to go with her, slipped off from the hike, and spent the whole afternoon following a strange man. They kept on his tail for two hours, right through the woods, and then, when they got into Amsterdam, handed him over to the patrols. What did they do that for? said Winston, somehow taken aback. Parsons went out triumphantly. My kid made sure he was some kind of enemy agent. Might have him dropped by parachute, for instance. But here's a boy. What do you think put her onto him in the first place? She spotted he was wearing a funny kind of shoes. Said she'd never seen anyone wearing shoes like that before. So the chances were he was a foreigner. Pretty smart for a nipper of seven, eh? What happened to the man? said Winston. Ah, uh, I can't say, of course. But I wouldn't be altogether surprised if... Parsons made the notion of aiming a rifle and clicked his tongue for the explosion. Good, said Sam abstractedly, without looking up from his strip of paper. Of course, we can't afford to take chances, agreed Winston dutifully. What I mean to say, there's a war on, said Parsons. As though in confirmation of this, a trumpet call floated from the telescreen just above their heads. However, it was not the proclamation of military victory this time, but merely an announcement from the Ministry of Plenty. Comrades, cried an eager youthful voice. Attention, comrades. We have glorious news for you. We have won the battle for production. Returns that completed of the output of all classes of consumption goods show that the standard of living has risen by no less than 20% over the past year. All over Oceania this morning were irrepressible spontaneous demonstrations when workers marched out of factories and offices and paraded through the streets with banners voicing their gratitude to Big Brother for the new happy life which his wise leadership has bestowed upon us. Here are some of the completed figures, foodstuffs. The phrase, our new happy life, recurred several times. It had been a favorite of late with the Ministry of Plenty. Parsons, his attention caught by the trouble caught, sat listening with a sort of gaping solemnity a sort of edified boredom. He could not follow the figures, but he was aware that they were in some way a cause for a satisfaction. He had lugged out a huge and filthy pipe, which was already half full of charred tobacco. With a tobacco ration at a hundred grams a week, it was seldom possible to fill a pipe up to the top. Winston was smoking a victory cigarette, which he held carefully horizontal. 
The new ration did not start till tomorrow, and he had only four cigarettes left. For the moment, he had shut his ears to remote noises and was listening to the stuff that streamed out of the telescreen. It appeared that there had even been demonstrations to thank Big Brother for raising the chocolate ration to 20 grams a week. And only yesterday, he reflected, it had been announced that the ration was to be reduced to 20 grams a week. Was it possible that they could swallow that after only 24 hours? Yes, they swallowed it. Parsons swallowed it so easily with the stupidity of an animal. The eyeless creature at the other table swallowed it fanatically, passionately, with a fierce desire to track down, denounce, and vaporize anyone who should suggest the last week the ration had been 30 grams. Sime too in some more complex way, involving double think. Sime swallowed it. Was he then alone in the possession of a memory? The fabulous statistics continued to pour out of the telescreen. As compared with last year, there was more food, more clothes, more houses, more furniture, more cooking pots, more fuel, more ships, more helicopters, more books, more babies, more of anything except disease, crime, and insanity. Year by year and minute by minute, Everybody and everything was whizzing rapidly upwards. As Simon had done earlier, Winston had taken up a spoon and was dabbling in the pale-colored gravy that dribbled across the table, drawing a long streak of it out into a pattern. He meditated resentfully on the physical texture of life. Had it always been like this? Had food always tasted like this? He looked round the canteen, a low-ceilinged, crowded room, its walls grimy from the contact of innumerable bodies, battered metal tables and chairs, placed so close together that you saw the elbows touching, bent spoons, dented trays, coarse white mugs, all surfaces greasy, grime in every crack and a sourish, composite smell of bad gin and bad coffee, and metallic stew and dirty clothes. Always in your stomach and in your skin, there was a sort of protest. A feeling that you had been cheated on something that you had a right to. It was true that he had no memories of anything greatly different. In any time that he could accurately remember, there had never been quite enough to eat. One had never had socks or underclothes that were not full of holes, furniture, had always been battered and rickety, rooms underheated, tube trains crowded, houses falling to pieces, bread dark colored, tea a rarity, coffee filthy tasting, cigarettes insufficient. Nothing cheap and plentiful except synthetic gin. And though, of course, it grew worse as one's body aged, was it not a sign that this was not the natural order of things if one's heart sickened at the discomfort and dirt and scarcity, the interminable winters, the stickiness of one's socks, the lifts that never worked, the cold water, the gritty soap, the cigarettes that came to pieces, the food with its strange evil tastes? Why should one feel it to be intolerable unless one had some kind of ancestral memory that things had once been different? He looked round the canteen again. Nearly everyone was ugly, and would still have an ugly, even if dressed otherwise than in the uniform blue overalls. On the far side of the room, Sitting at a table alone, 
A small, curiously beer-like man was drinking up a cough of coffee. His little eyes darting suspicious glances from side to side. How easy it was, thought Winston, if you did not look about you, to believe that the physical type set by the party was an ideal. Tall, muscular youths and deep-bosomed maidens, blond-haired, vital, sunburnt, carefree, existed and even predominated. Actually, so far as he could judge, the majority of people in Aristarch One were small, dark, and ill-favored. It was curious how that beetle-like type proliferated in the ministries. Little dumpy men, growing stout very early in life, with short legs, swift scuttling movements, and fat inscrutable faces, with very small eyes. It was a type that seemed to flourish best under the dominion of the party. The announcement from the Ministry of Plenty ended on another trumpet call, and gave way to tinny music. Parsons, stirred to vague enthusiasm by the bombardment of figures, took his pipe out of his mouth. The Ministry of Plenty certainly done a good job this year, he said with a knowing shake. Of his head. By the way, Smith, old boy, I suppose you haven't got any razor blades that you could let me have. Not once, said Winston. I've been using the same blade for six weeks myself. Ah well, just thought I'd ask you, old boy. Sorry, said Winston. The quacking voice from the next table, temporarily silenced. During the ministry's announcement, and started up again as loud as ever. For some reason, Winston suddenly found himself thinking of Mrs. Parson, with her wispy hair and the dust and the creases of her face. Within two years, those children would be denouncing her to the thought police. Mrs. Parsons would be vaporized. Syme would be vaporized. Winston would be vaporized. O'Brien would be vaporized. Parsons, on the other hand, would never be vaporized. The eyeless creature with a quacking voice would never be vaporized. The little beetle-like men who scuttled so nimbly through the labyrinth corridors of ministries, they too would never be vaporized. And the girl with dark hair, the girl from the fiction department, she would never be vaporized either. It seemed to him that he knew instinctively who would survive and who would perish. Though just what it was that made for survival, it was not easy to say. At this moment, he was dragged out of his reverie with a violent jerk. The girl at the next table had turned partly round, and was looking at him. It was a girl with dark hair. She was looking at him in a sidelong way, but with curious intensity. The instant that she caught his eye, she looked away again. The sweat started out on Winston's backbone. A horrible pang of terror went through him. It was gone almost at once. But it left a sort of nagging uneasiness behind. Why was she watching him? Why did she keep following him about? Unfortunately, he could not remember whether she had already been at the table when he arrived, or had come there afterwards. But yesterday, at any rate, during the two minutes' hate, she had sat immediately behind him, when there was no apparent need to do so. Quite likely, her real object had been to listen to him and make sure whether he was shouting loudly enough. His earlier thought returned to him. Probably she was not actually a member of the thought police, but then it was precisely the amateur spy who was the greatest danger of all. 
He did not know how long she had been looking at him, but perhaps for as much as five minutes. And it was possible that his features had not been perfectly under control. It was terribly dangerous to let your thoughts wander when you were in any public place or within range of a telescreen. The smallest thing could give you away. A nervous tick, an unconscious look of anxiety, a habit of muttering to yourself. Anything that carried with it the suggestion of abnormality, of having something to hide. In any case, to wear an improper expression on your face. To look incredulous when the victory was announced, for example, was itself a punishable offense. There was even a word for it in Newspeak. Face crime, it was called. The girl had turned her back on him again. Perhaps, after all, she was not really following him about. Perhaps it was coincidence that she had sat so close to him two days running. His cigarette had gone out, and he laid it carefully on the edge of a table. He would finish smoking it after work, if he could keep the tobacco in it. Quite likely the person at the next table was a spy of the thought police, and quite likely he would be in the cellars of the Ministry of Love for the three days. But a cigarette end must not be wasted. Syme had folded up his strip of paper and stowed it away in his pocket. Parsons had begun talking again. Did I ever tell you, old boy, he said, chuckling round the stem of his pipe. About the time when those two nippers of mine set fire to the old market woman's skirt, because they saw her wrapping up sausages in a poster of B.B. Sneaked up behind her and set fire to it with a box of matches. Burned her quite badly, I believe. Little beggars, eh? But keen as mustard. That's a first-rate training they give them in the spies nowadays. Better than in my day, even. What do you think's the latest thing they've served them out with? Ear trumpets for listening through keyholes. My little girl brought one of home the other night, trotted out on her ceiling room door, and reckoned she could hear twice as much as with her ear to be whole. Of course it's only a toy, mind you. Still, gives them the right idea, hey? Eh? At this moment, the telescreen let out a piercing whistle. It was a signal to return to work. All three men sprang to their feet to join in the struggle round the lifts, and the remaining tobacco fell out of Winston's cigarette. Winston was writing in his diary. It was three years ago. It was on a dark evening in a narrow side street near one of the big railway stations. She was standing near a doorway in the wall, under a street lamp that hardly gave any light. She had a young face, painted very thick. It was really the paint that appealed to me, the whiteness of it, like a mask, and the bright red lips. Party women never paint their faces. There was nobody else in the street and no telescreens. She said two dollars. I... For the moment, it was too difficult to go on. He shut his eyes and pressed his fingers against them, trying to squeeze out the vision that kept recurring. He had an almost overwhelming temptation to shout a string of filthy words at the top of his voice or to bang his head against the wall, to kick over the table and hurl the ink pot through the window, to do any violent or noisy or painful thing that might black out the memory that was tormenting him. Your worst enemy, he reflected, was your own nervous system. At any moment, the tension inside you was liable to translate itself into some visible symptom. 
he thought of a man whom had passed in the street a few weeks back. A quite ordinary looking man, a party member, aged 35 or 40, tallish and thin, carrying a briefcase. They were a few meters apart when the left side of the man's face was suddenly contorted by a sort of spasm. It happened again just as they were passing one another. It was only a twitch, a quiver, rapid as the clicking of a camera shutter, but obviously habitual. He remembered thinking at the time, that poor devil is done for, and what was frightening was that the action was quite possibly unconscious. The most deadly danger of all was talking in your sleep. There was no way of guarding against that, so far as he could see. He drew in his breath and went on writing. I went with her through the doorway and across the backyard into a basement kitchen. There was a bed against the wall and a lamp on the table turned very low. She... His teeth were set on edge. He would have liked to spit. Simultaneously with the woman in the baseball kitchen, he thought of Catherine, his wife. Winston was married, had been married at any rate. Probably he was still married, for so as far he knew his wife was not dead. He seemed to breathe again the warm, stuffy odor of the basement kitchen. An odor compounded of bugs and dirty clothes and villainous cheap scent. But nevertheless alluring because no woman of the party ever used scent, or could be imagined as doing so. Only the prolies use scent. In his mind, the smell of it was inextricably mixed up with fornication. When he had gone with that woman, it had been his first lapse in two years or thereabouts. Consorting with prostitutes was forbidden, of course, but it was one of those rules that you could occasionally nerve yourself to break. It was dangerous, but it was not a life and death matter. To be caught with a prostitute might mean five years in a forced labor camp, not more if you had committed no other offense. And it was easy enough, provided that you could avoid being caught in the act. The poor quarters swarmed with women who were ready to sell themselves. Some could even be purchased for a bottle of gin, which the prolies were not supposed to drink. Tacitly, the party was even inclined to encourage prostitution as an outlet for instincts which could not be altogether suppressed. Mere debauchery did not matter very much, so long as it was furtive and joyless, and only involved the woman of a submerged and despised class. The unforgivable crime was promiscuity between party members. But though this was one of the crimes that the accused and the great purges invariably confessed to, it was difficult to imagine any such thing actually happening. The aim of the party was not merely to prevent men and women from forming loyalties which it might not be able to control. Its real undeclared purpose was to remove all pleasure from the sexual act. Not love so much as erot eroticism was the enemy, inside marriage as well as outside it. All marriages between party members had to be approved by a committee appointed for the purpose. And, though the principle was never clearly stated, permission was always refused if a couple concerned gave the impression of being physically attracted to one another. The only recognized purpose of marriage was to beget children for the service of the party. Sexual intercourse was to be looked on as a slightly disgusting minor operation, like having an enema. This again was never put into plain words, 
but in an indirect way, it was rubbed into every party member from childhood onwards. There were even organizations such as the Junior Anti-Sex League, which advocated complete celibacy for both sexes. All children were to be begotten by artificial insemination, artsum, it was called in Newspeak, and brought up in public institutions. This, Winston was aware, was not meant altogether seriously, but somehow it fitted in with the general ideology of the party. The party was trying to kill the sex instinct, or if it could not be killed, then to distort it and dirty it. He did not know why this was so, but it seemed natural that it should be so. And so far as the women were concerned, the party's efforts were largely successful. He thought again of Catherine. It must be nine, ten, nearly eleven years since they had parted. It was curious how seldom he thought of her. For days at a time, he was capable of forgetting that he had ever been married. They had only been together for about 15 months. The party did not permit divorce, but it rather encouraged separation in cases where there were no children. Catherine was a tall, fair-haired girl, very straight, with splendid movements. She had a bold, aquiline face, a face that one might have called noble until one discovered that there was as nearly as possible nothing behind it. Very early in their married life, he had decided, though perhaps it was only that he knew her more intimately than he knew most people, that she had, without exception, the most stupid, vulgar, empty mind that he had ever encountered. She had not a thought in her head that was not a slogan, and there was no imbecility, absolutely none, that she was not capable of swallowing if the party handed it out to her. The human soundtrack he nicknamed her in his own mind. Yet, he could have endured living with her if it had not been for just one thing. Sex. As soon as he touched her, she seemed to wince and stiffen. To embrace her was like embracing a jointed wooden image. And what was strange was that even when she was clasping him against her, he had the feeling that she was simultaneously pushing him away with all her strength. The rigidity of her muscles managed to convey that impression. She would lie there with shut eyes neither resisting nor cooperating, but submitting. It was extraordinarily embarrassing and, after a while, horrible. But even then, he could have borne living with her if it had been agreed that they should remain celibate. But curiously enough, it was Catherine who refused this. They must, she said, produce a child if they could. So the performance continued to happen once a week quite regularly, whenever it was not impossible. She used even to remind him of it in the morning as something which had to be done that evening and which must not be forgotten. She had two names for it. One was making a baby and the other was our duty to the party. Yes. She had actually used that phrase. Quite soon, he grew to have a feeling of positive dread when he appointed day came round. But luckily, no child appeared, and in the day, she agreed to give up trying, and soon afterwards, they parted. Winston sighed inaudibly. He picked up his pen again and wrote. She threw herself down on the bed, and at once without any kind of preliminary in the most coarse, horrible way you could imagine, pulled up her skirt. I... He saw himself standing there in the dim lamplight, with a smell of bugs and cheap scent in his nostrils, and in his heart a feeling of defeat and resentment 
which even at that moment was mixed up with the thought of Catherine's white body, frozen forever by the hypnotic power of a party. Why did it always have to be like this? Why could he not have a woman of his own instead of these filthy scuffles at intervals of years? But a real love affair was an almost unthinkable event. The women of the party were all alike. Chastity was deeply ingrained in them as partly loyalty. By careful early conditioning, by school and in the spies and the youth league, by lectures, parades, songs, slogans, and martial music, the natural feeling had been driven out of him. His reason told him that there must be exceptions, but his heart did not believe it. They were all impregnable, as a party intended that they should be. And what he wanted, more even than to be loved, was to break down that wall of virtue, even if it were only once in his whole life. The sexual act, successfully performed, was rebellion. Desire was thought crime. Even to have awakened Catherine, if he could have achieved it, would have been like a seduction, although she was his wife. But the rest of the story had got to be written down, he wrote, I turned up the lamp when I saw her in the light. After the darkness, the feeble light of the paraffin lamp had seemed very bright. For the first time he could see the woman properly. He had taken a step toward her and then halted, full of lust and terror. He was painfully conscious of the risk he had taken in coming here. It was painfully conscious of the risk he had taken in coming here. It was perfectly possible that the patrols would catch him on the way out. For that matter, they might be waiting outside the door at this moment. If he went away without even doing what he had come here to do, it had got to be written down, it had got to be confessed. What he had suddenly seen in the lamplight was that the woman was old. The paint was plastered so thick on her face that it looked as though it might crack like a cardboard mask. There were streaks of white in her hair, but the truly dreadful detail was that her mouth had fallen a little open, revealing nothing except a cavernous blackness. She had no teeth at all. He wrote hurriedly in a scrabbling handwriting. When I saw her in the light, she was quite an old woman, fifty years old at least. But I went ahead and did it just the same. He pressed his fingers against his eyelids again. He had written it down at last, but it made no difference. The therapy had not worked. The urge to shout filthy words at the top of his voice was as strong as ever. If there is hope, wrote Winston, it lies in the Prolies. If there was hope, it must lie in the Prolies because only there, in those swarming disregarded masses, 85% of the population of Oceania could the force to destroy the party ever be generated. The party could not be overthrown from within. Its enemies, if it had any enemies, had no way of coming together or even of identifying one another. Even if the legendary brotherhood existed, as just possibly it might, it was inconceivable that its members could ever assemble in larger numbers than twos and threes. Rebellion meant a look in the eyes, an inflection of the voice at the most, an occasional whispered word. But the proles, if only they could somehow become conscious of their own strength, would have no need to conspire. They needed only to rise up and shake themselves like a horse shaking off flies. If they chose, they could blow the party to pieces tomorrow morning. Surely, sooner or later, it must occur to them to do it, 
And yet, he remembered how once he had been walking down a crowded street when a tremendous shout of hundreds of voices, a woman's voices, had burst from a side street a little way ahead. It was a great formidable cry of anger and despair, a deep loud, oh, that went humming on like the reverberation of a bell. His heart had leapt. It started, he had thought, a riot. The prolies are breaking loose at last. When he had reached the spot, it was to see a mob of two or three hundred women crowding round the stalls of a street market, with faces as tragic as though they had been the doomed passengers on a sinking ship. But at this moment, the general despair broke down into a multitude of individual quarrels. It appeared that one of the stalls had been selling tin saucepans. They were wretched, flimsy things, but cooking pots of any kind were always difficult to get. Now the supply had unexpectedly given out. The successful woman, bumped and jostled by the rest, were trying to make off their saucepans while dozens of others clamored round the stall, accusing the stall keeper of favoritism and of having more saucepans somewhere in reserve. There was a fresh outburst of yells. Two bloated women, one of them with her hair coming down, had got hold of the same saucepan and were trying to tear it out of one another's hands. For a moment, they were both tugging, and then the handle came off. Winston watched them disgustedly. And yet, just for a moment, what almost frightening power had sounded in that crowd from only a few hundred throats? Why was it that... They could never shout like that about anything that matters. He wrote, Until they become conscious, they will never rubble. And until after they have rubbled, they cannot become conscious. That, he reflected, might almost have been a transcription from one of the party textbooks. The party claimed, of course, to have liberated the parolees from bondage. Before the revolution, they had been hideously oppressed by the capitalists. They had been starved and flogged. Women had been forced to work in the coal mines. Women still did work in the coal mines, as a matter of fact. Children had been sold into factories at the age of six. But simultaneously, true to the principles of doublethink, the party taught that the prolies were natural inferiors who must be kept in subjection, like animals, by the application of a few simple rules. In reality, very little was known about the prolies. It was not necessary to know much. So long as they continued to work and breed, their other activities were without importance. Left to themselves, like cattle turned loose upon the plains of Argentina. They had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern. They were born, they grew up in the gutters, they went to work at twelve, they passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire, they married at twenty, they were middle aged at thirty, they died for the most part at sixty. Heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all, gambling, filled up the horizon of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. A few agents of the thought police moved always among them, spreading false rumors and marking down and eliminating the few individuals who were judged capable of becoming dangerous but no attempt was made to indoctrinate them with the ideology of the party. It was not desirable that the prolies should have strong political feelings. All that was required of them was a primitive patriotism, which could be appealed to whatever 
it was necessary to make them accept longer working hours or shorter rations. And even when they become discontented, as they sometimes did, their discontent led nowhere because, being without general ideas, they could only focus on petty specific grievances. The larger evils invariably escaped their notice. The great majority of Pearlies did not even have telescreens at their homes. Even the civil police interfered with them very little. There was a vast amount of criminality in London, a whole world within a world of thieves, bandits, prostitutes, drug peddlers, and racketeers of every description. But since it all happened among the Pearlies themselves, it was of no importance. In all questions of morals, they were allowed to follow their ancestral code. The sexual puritanism of the party was not imposed upon them. Promiscuity went unpunished. Divorce was permitted. For that matter, even religious worship would have been permitted if the Pearlies had shown any sign of needing or wanting it. They were beneath suspicion. As a party slogan put it, Pearlies and animals are free. Winston reached down and cautiously scratched his varicose ulcer. It had begun itching again. The thing you invariably came back to was the impossibility of knowing what life before the revolution had really been like. He took out the drawer a copy of the children's history textbook, which he had borrowed from Mrs. Parsons, and began copying a passage into the diary. In the old days, it ran, before the glorious revolution, London was not the beautiful city that we know today. It was a dark, dirty, miserable place where hardly anybody had enough to eat and where hundreds and thousands of poor people had no boots on their feet and not even a roof to sleep under. Children no older than you are had to work 12 hours a day for cruel masters who flogged them with whips if they worked too slowly and fed them on nothing but stale bread crusts and water. But in among all this terrible poverty, there were just a few great big beautiful houses that were lived in by rich men who had as many as 30 servants to look after them. These rich men were called capitalists. They were fat, ugly men with wicked faces, like the one in the picture on the opposite page. You can see that he is dressed in a long black coat which is called a frock coat, and a queer, shiny hat, shaved like a stovepipe, which is called a stove hat. This was a uniform of the capitalists, and no one else was allowed to wear it. The capitalists owned everything in the world, and everyone else was their slave. They owned all the land, all the houses, all the factories, and all the money. If anyone disobeyed them, they could throw him into prison, or they could take his job away and starve him to death. When any ordinary person spoke to a capitalist, he had to cringe and bow to him, and take off his cap and address him as Sir. The chief of all the capitalists was called the King, and... But he knew the rest of the catalogue. There would be mentions of the bishops and their lawn sleeves, the judges and their ermine robes, the pillory, the stocks, the treadmill, the cat -o nine tails, the Lord Mayor's banquet, and the practice of kissing the Pope's toe. There was also something called Ju Prime Nocti, which would probably not be mentioned in a textbook for children. It was a law by which every capitalist had the right to sleep with any woman working in one of his factories. How could you tell how much of it was lies? It might be true that the average human being was better off now than he had been before the revolution. The only evidence to the contrary was a mute protest in your own bones, the instinctive feeling that the conditions you lived in were 
intolerable and that at some other time they must have been different. It struck him that the truly characteristic thing about modern life was not its cruelty and insecurity, but simply its bareness, its dinginess, its listlessness. Life, if you looked about you, bore no resemblance not only to the lies that streamed out of the telescreens, but even to the ideals that the party was trying to achieve. Great areas of it, even for a party member, were neutral and non-political. A matter of slogging through dreary jobs, fighting for a place on the tube, darning a worn-out sock, catching a saccharine tablet, saving a cigarette end. The ideal set up by the party was something huge, terrible, and glittering. A world of steel and concrete, of monstrous machines and terrifying weapons, a nation of warriors and fanatics, marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans, perpetually working, fighting, triumphing, persecuting, 300 million people, all with the same face. The reality was decaying, dingy cities, where underfed people shuffled to and fro in leaky shoes, and patched up 19th century houses that smelt always of cabbage and bad lavatories. He seemed to see a vision of London, vast and ruinous, sitting in a million dustbins, mixed up whether it was a picture of Mrs. Parsons, a woman with lined face and wispy hair, fiddling helplessly with a blocked waste pipe. He reached down and scratched his ankle again. Day and night, the telescreens bruised your ears with statistics, proving that people today had more food, more clothes, better houses, better recreations, that they lived longer, worked shorter hours, were bigger, healthier, stronger, happier, more intelligent, better educated than the people of 50 years ago. Not a word of it could ever be proved or disproved. The party claimed, for example, that today 40% of adult parolees were illiterate. Before the revolution, it was said, the number had only been 15%. The party claimed that the infant mortality rate was now only 160 per thousand, whereas before the revolution, it happened 300, and so it went on. It was like a single equation with two unknowns. It might very well be that literally every word in the history books, even the things that one accepted without question, was pure fantasy. For all he knew, there might never have been any such law as a Juprime Nocti, or any such creature as a capitalist, or any such garment as a top hat. Everything faded into mist. The past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. Just once in his life he had possessed after Vivet. That was what counted. Concrete, unmistakable evidence of an act of falsification. He had held it between his fingers for as long as 30 seconds. In 1973, it must have been. At any rate, it was at about the time when he and Catherine had parted. But the really relevant date was seven or eight years earlier. The story really began in the middle 60s, the period of the Great Purges in which the original leaders of the revolution were wiped out once and for all. By 1970, none of them was left, except Big Brother himself. All the rest had by that time been exposed as traitors and counter-revolutionaries. Goldstein had fled and was hiding, no one knew where, and of the others, a few had suddenly disappeared while the majority had been executed after spectacular public trials at which they made confessions of their crimes. Among the last survivors, were three men named Jones, 
Aronson, and Rutherford. It must have been in 1965 that these three had been arrested. As often happened, they had vanished for a year or more, so that one did not know whether they were alive or dead, and that had suddenly been brought forth to incriminate themselves in the usual way. They had confessed to intelligence with the enemy. At that date, too, the enemy was Eurasia. Embezzlement of public funds, the murder of various trusted party members, intrigues against the leadership of Big Brother, which had started long before the revolution happened, and acts of sabotage causing the death of hundreds of thousands of people. After confessing to these things, they had been pardoned, reinstated in the party, and given posts, which were in fact sinecures, but which sounded important. All three had written long, abject articles in the Times, analyzing the reasons for their defection and promising to make amends. Some time after their release, Winston had actually seen all three of them in the Chestnut Tree Cafe. He remembered the sort of terrified fascination with which he had watched them out of the corner of his eye. They were men far older than himself, relics of the ancient world, almost the last great figures left over from the heroic days of the party. The glamour of the underground struggle and the civil war still faintly clung to them. He had the feeling, though already at that time, facts and dates were growing blurry, that he had known their names years earlier when he had known that of Big Brother. But also, they were outlaws, enemies, untouchables, doomed with absolute certainty to extinction within a year or two. No one who had once fallen into the hands of the Thought Police ever escaped in the end. They were corpses waiting to be sent back to the grave. There was no one at any of the tables nearest to them. It was not wise even to be seen in the neighborhood of such people. They were sitting in silence before glasses of a gin flavored with cloves, which was a specialty of the cafe. Out of three, it was Rutherford whose appearance had most impressed Winston. Rutherford had once been a famous caricaturist whose brutal cartoons had helped to inflame popular opinions before and during the revolution. Even now, at long intervals, his cartoons were appearing in the Times. There was simply an imitation of his earlier manner, and curiously lifeless and unconvincing. Always there were a rehashing of the ancient themes. Slum tenements, starving children, street battles, capitalists in top hats. Even on the barricades of the capitalists still seemed to cling to their top hats an endless, hopeless effort to get back into the past. He was a monstrous man with a mane of greasy gray hair, his face pouched and seamed with protuberant lips. At one time, he must have been immensely strong. Now his great body was sagging, sloping, bulging, falling away in every direction. He seemed to be breaking up before one's eyes like a mountain crumbling. It was a lonely hour of fifteen. Winston could not now remember how he had come to be in the cafe at such a time. The place was almost empty. A tinny music was trickling from the telescreens. The three men sat in their corner, almost motionless, never speaking. Uncommanded. The waiter brought fresh glasses of gin. There was a chessboard on the table beside them with the pieces set out, but no game started. And then, for perhaps half a minute and all, something happened to the telescreens. The tune that they were playing changed, and the tone of the music changed too. There came into it, but it was something hard to describe. It was a peculiar, cracked, braying, deering note. In his mind, Winston called it a yellow note. And then a voice from the telescreen was singing, 
Under the spreading chestnut tree, I sold you and you sold me. There lie they, and here lie we. Under the spreading chestnut tree. The three men never stirred. But when Winston glanced again at Rutherford's ruinous face, he saw that his eyes were full of tears. And for the first time he noticed, with a kind of inward shudder, and yet not knowing at what he shuddered, that both Aronson and Rutherford had broken noses. A little later, all three were rearrested. It appeared that they had engaged in fresh conspiracies from the very moment of their release. At their second trial, they confessed to all their old crimes over again with a whole string of new ones. They were executed, and their fate was recorded in the party histories, a warning to posterity. About five years after this, in 1973, Winston was unrolling a wad of documents, which had just flopped out of a pneumatic tube onto his desk when he came on a fragment of paper which had evidently been slipped in among the others and then forgotten. The instant he had flattened it out, he saw its significance. It was a half page torn out of the times of about 10 years earlier, the top half of the page, so that it included the date and it contained a photograph of the delegates at some party function in New York. Prominent in the middle of a group were Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. There was no mistaking them. In any case, their names were in the caption at the bottom. The point was that at both trials, all three men had confessed that on that date they had been on Eurasian soil. They had flown from a secret airfield in Canada to a rendezvous somewhere in Siberia and had conferred with members of the Eurasian general staff to whom they had betrayed important military secrets. The date had stuck in Winston's memory because it chanced to be midsummer day. But the whole story must be on record on countless other places as well. There was only one possible conclusion the confessions were lies. Of course, this was not in itself a discovery. Even at that time, Winston had not imagined that the people who were wiped out in the purges had actually committed the crimes that they were accused of. But this was concrete evidence. It was a fragment of the abolished past, like a fossil bone which turns up in the wrong stratum and destroy the geolo geological theory. It was enough to blow the part to atoms, if in some way it could have been published to the world and its significance made known. He had gone straight on working. As soon as he saw what the photograph was and what it meant, he had covered it up with another sheet of paper. Luckily, when he unrolled it, it had been upside down from the point of view of the telescreen. He took his scribbling pad on his knee and pushed back his chair so as to get as far away from the telescreen as possible. To keep your face expressionless was not difficult, and even your breathing could be controlled with an effort. But you could not control the beating of your heart, and the telescreen was quite delicate enough to pick it up. He let what he judged to be ten minutes go by, tormented all the while by the fear that some accident, a sudden draught blowing across his desk, for instance, would betray him. Then, without uncovering it again, he dropped the photograph into the memory hole, along with some other waste papers. Within another minute, perhaps, it would have crumbled into ashes. That was 10, 11 years ago. Today, probably, he would have kept that photograph. It was curious that the fact of having held it in his fingers seemed to him to make a difference even now, when the photograph itself, as well as the event it recorded, was only memory. Was the party's hold upon the past less strong, he wondered, because a piece of evidence which existed no longer had once existed? 
But today, supposing that it could be somehow resurrected from its ashes, the photograph might not even be evidence. Already, at the time when he made his discovery, Oceania was no longer at war with Eurasia, and it must have been to the agents of East Asia that the three dead men had betrayed their country. Since then, there have been other changes. Two, three, he could not remember how many. Very likely, the confessions have been rewritten and rewritten until the original facts and dates no longer have the smallest significance. The past not only changed, but changed continuously. What most afflicted him with a sense of nightmare was that he had never clearly understood why the huge imposture was undertaken. The immediate advantages of falsifying the past were obvious, but the ultimate motive was mysterious. He took up his pen again and wrote, I understand how. I do not understand why. He wondered, as he had many times wondered before, whether he himself was a lunatic. Perhaps a lunatic was simply a minority of one. At one time it had been a sign of madness to believe that the earth goes round the sun. Today, to believe that the past is unalterable. He might be alone in holding that belief, and if alone, then a lunatic. But the thought of being a lunatic did not greatly trouble him. The horror was that he might also be wrong. He picked up the children's history book and looked at the portrait of Big Brother, which formed its frontispiece. The hypnotic eyes gazed onto his own. It was as though some huge force were pressing down upon you. Something that penetrated inside your skull, battering against your brain, frightening you out of your beliefs, persuading you almost to deny the evidence of your senses. In the end, the party would announce that two and two made five, and you would have to believe it. It was inevitable that they should make that claim sooner or later. The logic of their position demanded it. Not merely the validity of experience, but the very existence of external reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. The heresy of heresies was common sense. And what was terrifying was not that they would kill you for thinking otherwise, but that they might be right. For, after all, how do we know that two and two make four, or that the force of gravity works, or that the past is unchangeable? If both the past and the external world exist only in the mind, and if the mind itself is controllable, what then? But no, his courage seemed suddenly to stiffen of its own accord. The face of O'Brien, not called up by any obvious association, had floated into his mind. He knew, with more certainty than before, that O'Brien was on his side. He was writing the diary for O'Brien. To O'Brien. It was like an in interminable letter which no one would ever read, but which was addressed to a particular person and took its color from that fact. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was your final, most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against him, the ease with which any party intellectual could overthrow him in debate the subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less answer. And yet he was in the right. They were wrong, and he was right. The obvious, the silly, and the true had got to be defended. 
truisms are true. Hold on to that. The solid world exists. Its laws do not change. Stones are hard. Water is wet. Objects unsupported fall toward the Earth's center. With a feeling that he was speaking to O'Brien, and also that he was setting forth an important axiom, he wrote, Freedom is a freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. From somewhere at the bottom of the passage, the smell of roasting coffee, real coffee, not victory coffee, came floating out into the street. Winston paused involuntarily. For perhaps two seconds, he was back in the half-forgotten world of his childhood. Then a door banged, seeming to cut off the smell as abruptly as though it had been a sound. He had walked several kilometers over pavements, and his varicose ulcer was throbbing. This was the second time in three weeks that he had missed an evening at the community center. A rash act, since you could be certain that the number of your attendances at the center were carefully checked. In principle, a party member had no spare time and was never alone except in bed. It was assumed that when he was not working, eating, or sleeping, he would be taking part in some kind of communal re recreations. To do anything that suggested a taste or solitude, even to go for a walk by yourself, was always slightly dangerous. There was a word for it in Newspeak. Own life, it was called, meaning individualism and eccentricity. But this evening, as he came out of the ministry, the balminess of the April air had tempted him. The sky was a warmer blue than he had seen it that year, and suddenly the long, nosy evening in the center, the boring, exhausting games, the lectures, the creaking camaraderie oiled by gin, had seemed intolerable. On impulse, he had turned away from the bus stop and wandered off into the labyrinth of London, for south, then east, then north again, losing himself along unknown streets and hardly bothering in which direction he was going. If there is hope, he had written in his diary, it lies in the proles. The words kept coming back to him statement of a mystical truth and a palpable absurdity. He was somewhere in the vague, brown-colored slums to the north and east of what had once been St. Pancras Station. He was walking up a cobbled street of little two-story houses with battered doorways which gave straight on the pavement and which were somehow curiously suggest suggestive of rat holes. There were puddles of filthy water here and there among the cobbles. In and out of the dark doorways and down narrow alleyways that branched off on either side, people swarmed in astonishing numbers. Girls in full bloom with crudely lipsticked mouths and youths who chased the girls and swollen waddling women who showed you what the girls would be like in 10 years time. And old bent creatures shuffling along on splayed feet, and ragged, barefooted children who played in the puddles and then scattered at angry yells from their mothers. Perhaps a quarter of the windows in the street were broken and boarded up. Most of the people paid no attention to Winston. A few eyed him with a sort of guarded curiosity. Two monstrous women with brick-red forearms folded across their aprons were talking outside a doorway. Winston caught scraps of conversation as he approached. Yes, I says to her, that's all very well, I says, but if you'd have been in my place, you'd have done the same as what I've done. It's easy to criticize, I says, but you ain't got the same problems as what I got. Ah, said the other. That's just it. That's just where it is. 
the strident voices stopped abruptly. The woman studied him in hostile silence as he went past. But it was not hostility exactly. Merely a kind of weariness, a momentarily stiffening, as at the passing of some unfamiliar animal. The blue overalls of the party could not be a common sight in a street like this. Indeed, it was unwise to be seen in such places unless you had definite business there. The patrols might stop you if you happened to run into them. May I see your papers, comrade? What are you doing here? What time did you leave work? Is this your usual way home? And so on and so forth. Not that there was any rule against walking home by an unusual route, but it was enough to draw attention to you if the thought police heard about it. Suddenly, the whole street was in commotion. There were yells of warning from all sides. People were shooting into the doorways like rabbits. A young woman leapt out of the doorway a little ahead of Winston, grabbed up a tiny child playing in a puddle, whipped her apron around it, and leapt back again, all in one movement. At the same instant, a man in a concertina-like black suit, who had emerged from a side alley, ran toward Winston, pointing excitedly to the sky. Steamer, he yelled. Look out, governor. Bang over it. Lay down quick. Steamer was a nickname which, for some reason, the prolies applied to rocket bombs. Winston promptly flung himself on his face. The prolies were nearly always right when they gave you a warning of this kind. They seemed to possess some kind of instinct which told them several seconds in advance when a rocket was coming, although the rocket supposedly traveled faster than sound. Winston clasped his forearm about his head. There was a roar that seemed to make the pavements heave. A shower of light objects pattered onto his back. When he stood up, he found that he was covered with fragments of glass from the nearest window. He walked on. The bomb had demolished a group of houses 200 meters up the street. A black plume of smoke hung in the sky and below it a cloud of plaster dust in which a crowd was already forming round the ruins. There was a little pile of plaster laying on the pavement ahead of him, and in the middle of it he could see a bright red streak. When he got up to it, he saw that it was a human hand severed at the wrist. Apart from the bloody stump, the hand was so completely whitened as to resemble a plaster cast. He kicked the thing into the gutter and then, to avoid the crowd, turned down a side street to the right. Within three or four minutes, he was out of the area which the bomb had affected, and the sordid, swarming life of the streets was going on as though nothing had happened. It was nearly twenty hours, and the drinking shops, which the Pearlies frequented, pubs, they called them, were choked with customers. From their grimy swing doors, endlessly opening and shutting, there came forth a smell of urine, sawdust, and sour beer. In an angle formed by a projecting house, front three men were standing very close together, the middle one of them holding a folded up newspaper which the other two were studying over his shoulders. Even before he was near enough to make out the expression on their faces, Winston could see absorption in every line of their bodies. It was obviously some serious piece of news that they were reading. He was a few paces away from them when suddenly the group broke up and two of the men were in violent altercation. For a moment, they seemed almost on the point of blows. 
Can you bleeding well listen to what I say? I tell you no number ending in 781 for over 14 months. Yes, it has then. No, it has not. Black, oh my god, the old lot of them for over two years, wrote down on a piece of paper. I take some down regular as a clock. And I tell you, no number ending in seven. Yes, a seven has one. I could pretty near tell you the bleeding number. 407 it ended in. It was in February. Second week in February. February, your grandmother, I got it all down in black and white. And I tell you no number. Oh, pack it in, said the third man. They were talking about the lottery. Winston looked back when he had gone 30 meters. They were still arguing with vivid, passionate faces. The lottery, with its weekly payout of enormous prizes, was one of the one public event to which the Pearlies paid serious attention. It was probable that there were some millions of Pearlies for whom the lottery was a principle, if not the only reason for remaining alive. It was their delight, their folly, their anodyne, their intellectual stimulant. Where the lottery concerned, even people who could barely read and write seemed capable of intricate calculations and staggering feats of memory. There was a whole tribe of men who made a living simply by selling systems, forecasts, and lucky amulets. Winston had nothing to do with the running of the lottery, which was managed by the Minister of Plenty, but he was aware, indeed everyone in the party was aware, that the prizes were largely imaginary. Only small sums were actually paid out, the winners of the big prizes being non-existent persons. In the absence of any real, real intercommunication between one point of Oceania and another, this was not difficult to arrange. But if there was hope, it lay in the proles. You had to cling on to that. When you put it in words, it sounded reasonable. It was when you looked at the human beings passing you on the pavement that it became an act of faith. The street into which he had turned ran downhill. He had a feeling that he had been in his neighborhood before and that there was a main thoroughfare not far away. From somewhere ahead, there came a din of shouting voices. The street took a sharp turn, and then ended in a flight of steps which led down into a second alley where a few stall keepers were selling tired looking vegetables. At this moment, Winston remembered where he was. The alley led out into the main street, and down the next turning, not five minutes away, was a junk shop where he had bought the blank book which was now his diary. And in a small stationer's shop, not far away, he had bought his pen holder and his bottle of ink. He paused for a moment and at the top of the steps. On the opposite side of the alley, there was a dingy little pub whose windows appeared to be frosted over, but in reality were merely coated with dust. A very old man, bent foot active, with white mustaches that bristled forward like those of a prawn, pushed open the swing door and went in. As Winston stood watching, it occurred to him that the old man, who must be eighty at the least, had already been middle-aged when the revolution happened. He and a few others like him were the last links that now existed with the vanished world of capitalism. And the party itself, there were not many people left whose ideas had been formed before the revolution. The older generations had mostly been wiped out in the great purges of the 50s and 60s, and the few who survived had long ago been terrified into complete intellectual being surrender. If there was anyone still alive who could give you a truthful account of conditions in the early part of the century, it could only be a proly. Suddenly, 
a passage from the history book that he had copied into his diary came back into Winston's mind and a lunatic impulse took hold of him. He would go into the pub, he would scrape acquaintance with that old man and question him. He would say to him, Tell me about your life when you were a boy. What was it like in those days? Were things better than they are now or were they worse? Hurriedly, lest he should have time to become frightened, he descended the steps and crossed the narrow street. It was madness, of course. As usual, there was no definite rule against talking to prolies and frequenting their pubs, but it was far too unusual an action to pass unnoticed. If the patrols appeared, he might plead an attack of faintness, but it was not likely that they would believe him. He pushed open the door, and a hideous, treasy smell of sour beer hit him in the face. As he entered, the din of voices dropped to about half its volume. Behind his back, he could feel everyone eyeing his blue overalls. A game of darts, which was going on at the other end of the room, interrupted itself for perhaps as much as 30 seconds. The old man whom he had followed was standing at the bar, having some kind of altercation with a barman, a large, stout, hook-nosed young man with enormous forearms. A knot of others, standing round with glasses in their hands, were watching the scene. "'I are too civil enough, didn't I?' said the old man, straightening his shoulders pugnaciously. "'You telling me you ain't got a pint mug in the old bleeding boozer? And what the hell's name is, is a pint? said the barman, leaning forward with the tips of his finger on the counter. I got him. Call itself barman and don't know what a pint is. Why, a pint is a half of a quart, and there's four quarts to the gallon. I have to teach you the ABC next. Never heard of him, said the barman shortly. Leader and half leader, that's all you serve. There's a glasses on the shelf in front of you. I likes a pint, persisted the old man. You could have jobbed me off a pint easy enough. We didn't have these bleeding leaders when I was a young man. When you were a young man, we were all living in the treetops, said the barman. With a glance at the other customers... There was a shout of laughter, and uneasiness caused by Winston's entry seemed to disappear. The old man's white stubbled face had flushed pink. He turned away, muttering to himself, and bumped into Winston. Winston caught him gently by the arm. May I offer you a drink? he said. You are a gent, said the other. Straightening his shoulders again. He appeared not to have noticed Winston's blue overalls. Pint, he added aggressively to the barman. Pint of wallop. The barman swished two half liters of the dark brown beer into thick glasses, which he had rinsed in a bucket under the counter. Beer was the only drink you could get in the Pruley pubs. The prolies were supposed not to drink gin, though in practice they could get hold of it easily enough. The game of darts was in full swing again, and the knot of men at the bar had begun talking about lottery tickets. Winston's presence was forgotten for a moment. There was a deal table under the window where he and the old man could talk without fear of being overheard. It was horribly dangerous, but at any rate, there was no telescreen in the room, a point he had made sure of as soon as he came in. E could have drawn me off a pint, grumbled the old man as he settled down behind his glass. A half leader ain't enough. It don't satisfy. And a old leader's too much. It starts a bladder running, let alone the price. 
You must have seen great changes since you were a young man, said Winston tentatively. The old man's pale blue eyes moved from the darts board to the bar, and from the bar to the door of the gents, as though it were in the bar room that he expected the changes to have occurred. The beer was better, he said finally, and cheaper. When I was a young man, mild beer, wallop, we used to call it, was four pence a pit. That was before the war, of course. Which war was that? said Winston. It's all war, said the old man vaguely. He took up his glass and his shoulders straightened again. It is wishing you the very best of elf. In his lean throat, the sharp pointed Adam's apple made a surprisingly rapid up and down movement, and the beer vanished. Winston went to the bar and came back with two more half liters. The old man appeared to have forgotten his prejudice against drinking a full liter. You're very much older than I am, said Winston. You must have been a grown up man before I was born. You can remember what it was like in the old days before the revolution. People of my age don't really know anything about those times. We can only read about them in books, and what it says in the books may not be true. I should like your opinion on that. The history books say that life before the revolution was completely different from what it is now. There was a most terrible oppression, injustice, poverty, worse than anything we can imagine. Here in London, the great mass of the people never had enough to eat from birth to death. Half of them hadn't even boots on their feet. They worked 12 hours a day, they left school at nine, they slept 10 in a room. And at the same time, there were a very few people, only a few thousands, the capitals, they were called, who were rich and powerful. They owned everything that there was to own. They lived in great gorgeous houses with 30 servants. They rode about in motor cars and four horse carriages. They drank champagne. They wore top hats. The old man brightened suddenly. Top hats, he said. Funny you should mention them. The same thing came into my head only yesterday, I don't know why. I was just thinking I ain't see a top hat in years. Going right out, they have. The last time I wore one was at my sister-in-law's funeral. And that was, well, I couldn't give you the date. But it must have been 50 years ago. Of course, it was only I for the occasion, you understand. It isn't very important about the top hats, said Winston patiently. The point is, these capitalists, they and a few lawyers and priests were so forth who lived on them, were the lords of the earth. Everything existed for their benefit. You, the ordinary people, the workers, were their slaves. They could do that they liked with you. They could ship you off to Canada like a cattle. They could sleep with your daughters if they chose. They could order you to be flogged with something called cat o' nine tails. You had to take your cap off when you passed them. Every capitalist went about with a gang of lackeys who... The old man brightened again. Lackeys, he said. Now there's a word I ain't heard since ever so long. Lackeys, the regular takes me back that does. I recollect, oh, donkeys, years ago. I used to sometimes go to Ide Park of a Sunday afternoon to hear the blokes speaking speeches. Salvation Army, Roman Catholics, Jews, Indians, all sorts there was. And there was one bloke, well, I couldn't give you his name, but a real powerful speaker he was. He didn't ask given to him. Lackeys, he says. Lackeys of the bourgeoisie. Fleckies of the ruling class. Parasites. That was another of them. 
and Yanas. You definitely call them Yanas. Of course, he was referring to the Labour Party. You understand? West had the feeling that they were talking at cross purposes. What I really wanted to know was this, he said. Do you feel that you have more freedom now than you had in those days? Are you treated more like a human being? In the old days, the rich people, the people at the top, the House of Lords, put the man reminiscently. The House of Lords, if you would like. What I'm asking is, were these people able to treat you as an inferior simply because they were rich and you were poor? Is it a fact, for instance, that you had to call them sir and take off your cap when you passed them? The old man appeared to think deeply. He drank off about a quarter of his beer before answering. Yes, he said. They liked you to touch their cap to them. It showed respect, like. I didn't agree with it myself, but I had done it often enough. Had to, as you might say. And was it usual? I'm only quoting what I've heard in history books. Was it usual for these people and their servants to push you off the pavement onto the gutter? One of them pushed me once," said the old man. "I recollected as if it was yesterday. It was boat race night. Terrible rowdy they used to get on the boaty race night. And I bumps into a young bloke on Shaftesbury Avenue. Quite the gent he was. Dress shirt, top hat, black overcoat. He was kind of zigzagging across the pavement, and I bumps into an accidental lake. He says. Why can't you look where you're going? He says. I says. You think you've bought the bleeding pavement? He says. I'll twist your bloody head off if you get fresh with me. I says. Is you're drunk. I'll give you in charge in half a minute. I says. And if you'll believe me, he puts his and on my chest and gives me a shove as pretty near sent me under the wheels of a bus. Well, I was only young in them days, and I was going to have fetched on one only. A sense of help helplessness took hold of Winston. The old man's memory was nothing but a rubbish heap of details. One could question him all day without getting any real information. The party histories might still be true after a fashion. They might even be completely true. He made a last attempt. Perhaps I have not made myself clear. He said, "What I am trying to say is this: You have been alive a very long time. You lived half your life before the revolution. In nineteen twenty-five, for instance, you were already grown up. Would you say, from what you can remember?" The life in nineteen twenty-five was better than it was now, or worse. If you could choose, would you prefer to live then or now? The old man looked meditatively at the darts board. He finished up his beer more slowly than before. When he spoke, it was at a tolerant, philosophic air, as though the beer had mellowed him. I know what you expect me to say," he said. "You expect me to say as I'd sooner be young again. Most people'd say they'd sooner be young if you asked them. You got your health and strength when you're young. When you get to my time of life, you ain't never well. I suffer something wicked from my feet, and my bladder is just terrible. Six and seven times a night, it hauls me out of bed." On the other end, there's great advantages in being an old man. You ain't got the same worries, no truck with woman, and that's a great thing. I ain't had a woman for near on thirty year, if you'd credit it, nor wanted to. That's more. Winston sat back against the window sill. It was no use going on. He was about to buy some more beer. When the old man suddenly got up and shuffled rapidly into the stinking urinal at the side of the room, 
the extra half liter was already working on him, Winston sat for a moment or two, gazing at his empty glass and hardly noticed when his feet carried him out the street again. Within twenty years at the most, he reflected, the huge and simple question, was life better before the revolution than it is now, would have ceased once and for all to be answerable. But in effect, it was unanswerable even now, since the few scattered survivors from the ancient world were incapable of comparing one age with another. They remembered a million useless things, a quarrel with a workmate, a hunt for a lost bicycle pump, the expression on a long dead sister's face, the swirls of dust on a windy morning seventy years ago. But all the relevant facts were outside the range of their vision. They were like the ant, which can see small objects, but not large ones. And when memory failed and written records were falsified, when that happened, the claim of the party to have improved the conditions of human life had got to be accepted because there did not exist and never again could exist any standard against which it could be tested. At this moment, his train of thought stopped abruptly. He halted and looked up. He was in a narrow street with a few dark little shops interspersed among dwelling houses. Immediately above his head, there hung three discolored metal balls which looked as if they had been once gilded. He seemed to know the place. Of course, he was standing outside the junk shop where he had bought the diary. A twinge of fear went through him. It happened a sufficiently rash act to buy the book in the beginning, and he had swore never to come near the place again. And yet... The instant that he allowed his thoughts to wander, his feet had brought him back here of their own accord. It was precisely against suicidal impulses of this kind that he had hoped to guard himself by opening the diary. At the same time, he noticed that although it was nearly 21 hours, the shot was still open. With a feeling that he would be less conspicuous inside than hanging about in the pavement, he stepped through the doorway. If questioned, he could plausibly say that he was trying to buy razor blades. The proprietor had just lighted a hanging oil lamp, which gave off an unclean but friendly smell. He was a man of perhaps sixty, frail and bowed, with a long benevolent nose, and mild eyes distorted by thin spectacles. His hair was almost white, but his eyebrows were bushy and still black. His spectacles, his gentle, fussy movements, and the fact that he was wearing an aged jacket of black velvet gave him a vague air of intellectuality, as though he had been some kind of literary man, or perhaps a musician. His voice was soft as though faded, and his accents less debased, and that of the majority of proleys. I recognize you on the pavement, he said immediately. You're the gentleman that bought the young lady's keepsake album. That was a beautiful bit of paper, that was. Cream laid, it used to be called. There's been no paper like that made for, oh, I dare say 50 years. He peered at Winston over the top of his spectacles. Is there anything special I could do for you? Or did you just want to look around? I was passing, said Winston vaguely. I just looked in. I don't want anything in particular. It's just as well, said the other, because I don't suppose I could have satisfied you. He made an apologetic gesture with a soft palmed hand. You see how it is. An empty shop, you might say. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. No demand any longer, and no stock either. Furniture, china, glass. It's all been broken up by degrees. And of course, the metal stuff's mostly been melted down. I haven't seen a brass candlestick in years. 
The tiny interior of the shop was in fact uncomfortably full, but there was almost nothing in of the slightest value. The floor space was very restricted because all around the walls were stacked innumerable dusty picture frames. In the window, there were trays of nuts and bolts, worn out chisels, pen knives with broken blades, tarnished watches that did not even pretend to be in going order, and other miscellaneous rubbish. Only on a small table in the corner was there a litter of odds and ends, lacquered stuff boxes, agate pooches, and the like, which looked as though they might be including something interesting. As Winston wandered around the table, his eyes was caught by a round, smooth thing that gleamed softly in the lamplight, and he picked it up. It was a heavy lump of glass, curved on one side, flat on the other, making it almost a ham hemisphere. There was a peculiar softness as of rainwater in both the color and the texture of the glass. At the heart of it, magnified by a curved surface, there was a strange pink convoluted object we call a rose or a sea anem anemone. What is it? said Winston, fascinated. That's coral, that is, said the old man. It must have come from the Indian Ocean. They used to kind of embed it in the glass. That wasn't made less than a hundred years ago, more by the look of it. It's a beautiful thing, said Winston. It is a beautiful thing said the other appreciatively. But there is not many that say so nowadays. He coughed. Now, if it had so happened that you wanted to buy it, that cost you four dollars. I can remember when a thing like that would have fetched eight pounds, and eight pounds was, well, I can't work it out. But it was a lot of money. But who cares about genuine antiques nowadays? Even the few that's left. Winston immediately paid over the four dollars and slid the cover coveted thing into his pocket. What appealed to him about it was not so much of his beauty as the air it seemed to possess of belonging to an age quite different from the present one. The soft, rain watery glass was not like any glass that he had ever seen. The thing was doubly attractive because of its apparent uselessness, though he could guess that it must once have been intended as a paperweight. It was very heavy in his pocket, but fortunately it did not make much of a bulge. It was a queer thing, even a compromising thing, for party member to have in his possession. Anything old, and for that matter anything beautiful, was always vaguely suspect. The old man had grown noticeably more cheerful after receiving the four dollars. Weston realized that he would have accepted three or even two. There's another room upstairs that you might care to take a look at, he said. There's not much in it. Just a few pieces. We'll do with a light if we're going upstairs. He lit another lamp and, with bowed back, led the way slowly up a steep and worn stairs and along a tiny passage into a room which he did not give on the street, but looked out on a cobbled yard and a forest of chimney pots. Winston noticed that the furniture was still arranged as though the room were meant to be lived in. There was a strip of carpet on the floor, a picture or two on the walls, and a deep sl slatterny armchair drawn up to the fireplace. An old-fashioned glass clock with a twelve-hour face was sticking away on the mantelpiece. Under the window, and occupying nearly a quarter of the room, was an enormous bed with a mattress still on it. We lived here till my wife died, said the old man half apologetically. 
I'm setting the furniture off by little and little. Now that's a beautiful mahogany bed. Or at least it would be if you could get the bugs out of it. But I dare say you'd find it a bit cumbersome. He was holding the lamp high up so as to illuminate the whole room and in the warm dim light the place looked curiously inviting. The thought flitted through Winston's mind that it would probably be quite easy to rent the room for a few dollars a week if he dared to take the risk. It was a wild impossible notion to be abandoned as soon as thought of. But the room had awakened in him a sort of nostalgia, a sort of ancestral memory. It seemed to him that he knew exactly what it felt like to sit in a room like this, in an armchair beside an open fire with her feet in the fender and a kettle on the hob, utterly alone, utterly secure, with nobody watching you, no voice pursuing you, no sound except the singing of the kettle and the friendly ticking of the clock. There is no telescreen, he could not help murmuring. Ah, said the old man, I never have one of those things. Too expensive. And I never seem to feel a need of it somehow. Now that's a nice gate leg -like table on the corner there. Though of course, you would have to put a few hinges on it if you wanted to use its flaps. There was a small bookcase in the other corner and Winston had already gravitated toward it. It contained nothing but rubbish. The hunting down and destruction of books had been done with the same thoroughness in the proly quarters as everywhere else. It was very unlikely that there existed anywhere in Oceania a copy of a book printed earlier than 1960. The old man still carrying the lamp, was standing in front of a picture in a rosewood frame which hung on the other side of the fireplace, opposite the bed. Now, if you happen to be interested in old prints at all, he began delicately. Winston came across to examine the picture. It was a steel engraving of an oval building with rectangular windows and a small tower in front. There was a railing running round the building, and at the rear end, there was what appeared to be a statue. Winston glazed at it for some moments. It seemed vaguely familiar, though he did not remember the statue. The frame's fixed to the wall, said the old man, but I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. I know that building, said Winston finally. It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of a street outside the Palace of Justice. That's right. Outside the law courts. It was bombed in, oh, many years ago. It was a church at one time. St. Clement Stane, its name was. He smiled apologetically, as though conscious of saying something slightly ridiculous, and added, Oranges and lemons. Say the bells of St. Clement's. What's that? said Winston. Oh, oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. That was a rhyme we, we had when I was a little boy. How it goes on, I don't remember, but I do know what it ended up. Here comes a can to let you do bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was a kind of a dance. They held out their arms for you to pass under, and when they came to hear come the chopper to chop off your head, they brought their arms round and caught you. It was just names of the churches. All the London churches were in it. All the principal ones, that is. Winston wondered vaguely to what century the church belonged. It was always difficult to determine the age of a London building. Anything large and impressive, if it was reasonably new in appearance, was automatically claimed as having been built to the revolution, while anything that was obviously of earlier date 
is ascribed to some dim period called the Middle Ages. The centuries of capitalism were held to have produced nothing of any value. One could not learn history from architecture any more than one can learn it from books. Statues, inscriptions, memorial stones, the names of streets. Anything that might throw light upon the past had been systematically altered. I never knew what happened at church, he said. There's a lot of them left, really, said the old man, though they've been put to other uses. Now, how did that rhyme go? Ha, ah, I've got it. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clements. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. There now, that's as far as I can get. A farthing, that was a small copper coin, looked something like a cent. Where is St. Martin's? said the Winston. St. Martin's? That's still standing. It's in Victory Square, alongside the picture gallery. A building with a kind of triangular porch and pillars in front, and a big flight of steps. Winston knew the place well. It was a museum used for propaganda displays of various kinds. Scale models of rocket bombs and floating fortresses, waxwork tableau, illustrating enemy atrocities and the like. St. Martin's and the Fields, it used to be called, supplemented the old man, though I don't recollect any fields anywhere in those parts. Winston did not buy the picture. It would have been an even more incongruous possession than the glass paperweight, and impossible to carry home, unless it were taken out of its frame. But he lingered for some minutes more, talking to the old man whose name, he discovered, was not Weeks, as one might have gathered from the inscription of the shop front, but Sherrington. Mr. Sherrington, it seemed, was a widower aged 63 and inhabited his shop for 30 years. Throughout that time, he had been intending to alter the name over the window, but had never got quite the point of doing it. All the while they that they were talking of the half-remembered rhyme kept running through Winston's head. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clements, you owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. It was curious, but when you said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells, the bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other, disguised and forgotten. From one ghostly steeple after another, he seemed to hear them peeling forth. Yet so far as he could remember, he had never in real life heard church bells ringing. He got away from Mr. Charrington and went down the stairs alone, so as not to let the old man see him reconnoitering in the street before stepping out the door. He had already made up his mind that after a suitable interval of months, say, he would take the risk of visiting the shop again. It was perhaps not more dangerous than shirking in an evening at the center. The serious piece of folly happened to come back here in the first place, after buying the diary and without knowing whether the proprietor of a shop could be trusted. However, yes, he thought again, he would come back. He would buy further scraps of beautiful rubbish. He would buy the engraving of St. Clement's Dane, take it out of its frame, and carry it home concealed under the jacket of his overalls. He would drag the rest of that poem out of Mr. Sherrington's memory. Even the lunatic project of renting the room upstairs flashed momentarily through his mind again. For perhaps five seconds, exultation made him to careless, and he stepped out onto the pavement without so much as a preliminary glance through the window. He had even started humming to an imp improvised tune. Suddenly, his heart seemed to turn to ice and his bowels to water. A figure in blue overalls was coming down the pavement, not ten meters away. It was a girl from fiction department, 
the girl with dark hair. The light was failing, but there was no difficulty in recognizing her. She looked him straight in the face and walked quietly on as though she had not seen him. For a few seconds, Winston was too paralyzed to move. Then he turned to the right and walked heavily away, not noticing for the moment that he was going in the wrong direction. At any rate, one question was settled. There was no doubting any longer the girl was spying on him. She must have followed him here because it was not credible that by pure chance she should have happened to be walking on the same evening up the same obscure black street, kilometers distant from any quarter where party members lived. It was too great a coincidence. Whether she was really an agent of a thought police or simply an amateur spy actuated by officiousness hardly mattered. It was enough that she was watching him. Probably she had seen him go into the pub as well. It was an effort to walk. The lump of glass in his pocket banged against his thighs at every step, and he was half-minded to take it out and throw it away. The worst thing was the pain in his belly. For a couple of minutes, he had the feeling that he would die if he had not reached a lavatory soon. But there would be no public lavatories in a quarter like this. And the spasm passed, leaving a dull ache behind. The street was blind alley. Winston halted, stood for several seconds, wondering vaguely what to do, when turned round and began to retrace his steps. As he turned it, occurred to him that the girl had only passed him three minutes ago and that by running he could probably catch up with her. He would keep on her track till they were in some quiet place and then smash her skull of that in with a cobblestone. The piece of glass in his pocket would be heavy enough for the job. But he abandoned the idea immediately because even the thought of making any physical effort was unbearable. He could not run, he could not strike a blow. Beside, she was young and lusty and would defend herself. He thought also of hurrying to the community center and staying there until the place closed, so as to establish a partial alibi for the evening. But that was too, was impossible. A deadly lassitude had taken hold of him. All he wanted was to get home quickly and then sit down and be quiet. It was after 22 hours when he got back to the flat. The lights would be switched off of the main at 23.30. He went into the kitchen and swallowed nearly a teacupful of victory gin. Then he went to the table in the alcove, sat down, and took the diary out from the drawer. But he did not open it at once. From the telescreen, a brassy female voice was squalling a patriotic song. He sat staring at the marbled cover of the book, trying without success to shut the voice out of his consciousness. It was at night that they came for you. Always at night. The proper thing was to kill yourself before they got you. Undoubtedly, some people did so. Many of the disappearances were actually suicides. But it needed desperate courage to kill yourself in a world where firearms or any quick and certain poison were completely unprocurable. He thought with a kind of astonishment of the biological uselessness of pain and fear, the treachery of human body which always freezes into inertia at exactly the moment when a special effort is needed. He might have silenced the dark-haired girl if only he had acted quickly enough. But precisely because of the extremity of his danger, he had lost the power to act. It struck him that in moments of crisis, one is never fighting against an external enemy, but is always against one's own body. Even now, in spite of the gin, the dull ache in his belly made consecutive thought impossible. And it is the same, he perceived, 
in all seemingly heroic or tragic situations. On the battlefield, in the torture chamber, on a sinking ship, the issues that you are fighting for are always forgotten because the body swells up until it fills the universe. And even when you're not paralyzed by fright or screaming with pain, life is a moment-to-moment -moment struggle against hunger or cold or sleeplessness, under a sour stomach or an aching tooth. He opened the diary. It's important to write something down. The woman on the telescreen had started a new song. Her voice seemed to stick into his brain like dragged splinters of glass. He tried to think of O'Brien for whom, or to whom, the diary was written. But instead, he began thinking of the things that would happen to him after the thought police took him away. It would not matter if they killed you at once. To be killed was what you expected. But before death, nobody spoke of such things, yet everybody knew of them. There was a routine of confession that had to be gone through. The groveling on the floor and screaming for mercy, the crack of broken bones, the smashed teeth and bloody clots of hair. Why did you have to endure it, since the end was always the same? Why was it not possible to cut a few days or weeks out of your life? Nobody ever escaped detection and nobody ever failed to confess. When once you had succumbed to thought crime, it was certain that by a given date, you would be dead. Why then did that horror, which altered nothing, have to lie embedded in future time? He tried with a little more success than before to summon up the image of O'Brien. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness, O'Brien had said to him. He knew what it meant, or thought he knew. The place where there is no darkness was the imagined future, which one would never see, but which, a foreknowledge, one can mystically share in. But with a voice from the telescreen nagging at his ears, he could not follow the train of thought further. He put a cigarette in his mouth. Half the tobacco promptly fell out onto his tongue. A bitter dust, which was difficult to spit out again. The face of Big Brother swam into his mind, displaying that of O'Brien. Just as he had done a few days earlier, he slid a coin out of his pocket and looked at it. The face gazed up at him, Heavy, calm, protecting. But what kind of smile was hidden behind the dark mustache? Like a leaden knell, the words came back at him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength.